Hey, guys and gals. Happy Galentine's Day. It's February the 13th. Welcome to the show, to the late show. This is your host, Young Brando. We're going to talk about some new releases. We're going to preview the Sotheby's New York auction as well. <clears throat> I feel like I'm getting sick, so I hope it's coming through. Let me know if the mic doesn't work properly. If there's anything wrong with the video, uh, let me know. But I'll start with what I was highlighting on the Instagram today. You might remember that St. Peter and I, we were talking about the watches that people were wearing in The Sopranos and specifically what watch, what Cartier Chris Moltisanti was wearing. And I was saying that he was wearing a Pasha and he was saying that he was, uh, Chris was wearing uh, Tank uh, Francaise. And it turns out that we were both right. Um, he is wearing here, sitting next to Tony, uh, Pasha in 18 karat yellow gold with a so-called uh, grill or grid that is diamond encrusted as far as I can tell. And you can see how this particular iteration of the Pasha is truly uh, a Gérald Janta design through and through. Uh, if you remember the story, at least uh, the mythological story behind his design um, of the royal oak and, and that octagonal bezel that is bolted uh, on the case, his inspiration was uh, this sort of uh, rustic uh, diver's helmet. And he has that kind of primal scene uh, that he talks about um, near one of the bridges in Geneva when he saw, um, saw a diver preparing for a plunge and people fixing his helmet. And, and you can see how uh, both with that uh, particular crown construction, right, where it almost looks like a flask that you can, uh, you know, pop off the cap from, and with this sort of grid-like structure that latches onto the case, and that is actually removable. Um, it really comes through, uh, the Pasha, I think, really comes into its own as uh, Gérard Janta design, as what it truly is. And uh, just so you guys know, if in this day and age you wanted to buy a Pasha from Cartier, um, one of the things they actually still do is, uh, even if the model that you are interested in doesn't come with uh, Grill, you can basically order one uh, with them uh, in the same material. And I'm sure with the precious metal versions, there's always an option to get it uh, diamond set or diamond encrusted as well if you're into that sort of thing. And you know what? Why not? Right? It's a Cartier watch, so it is supposed to be uh, ostentatious. It is supposed to be showy. It's supposed to be design and style forward. So you might as well go all the way. Um, and here is... I, I love that scene. Uh, this is the scene of the writer's block. I don't know if you guys remember, but early on in the show, um, Michael Imperioli's character uh, tries to write this script or a book uh, of a kind of mafia story, right? And, and <laughs> he just gets uh, angry and frustrated at himself and... and Becomes a pretty un insufferable person, honestly. But this is the watch he wears when he sits down to write. And as far as I can tell, this is also a gem set piece. Uh, it is uh, the older 
definition, uh, older version, of course, of the uh, tank uh, Francaise. Uh, the new line was just introduced. So uh, there's no way that, that they could have retrofitted something like that. Though, you know, with everything they have done for the marketing campaign, you can you can certainly expect. You remember the whole premise was going back and forth in time uh, to somehow assert the timelessness of the design. I can't hate them for that. The tank is certainly, uh, perhaps they're not oldest wristwatch, but probably the most iconic one, probably uh, much more recognizable than even the Santos, which is probably, by all accounts really, uh, the first wristwatch designed to be worn by men. Um, the honor for the first wristwatch to be worn by woman goes to Breguet, I think, with, with uh, La Reine de Naples, uh, which is um, made for Napoleon's uh, sister, I think. I think that was the story. I'm kind of blanking out. But hey, uh, I, I love the way he wears this thing. I love the way he wears the watch, but most of all, I identify with uh, the existential angst uh, of this particular character. Um, as much as I like uh, Tony Soprano himself, I guess Chris Moltisanti is really uh, my favorite character as well, which is what one of the supporters here is saying as well. Yeah, Evan, I I don't know if you were supporting the Eagles, but um, yeah, man, I, I feel for you. I feel for you, if you were. <sighs> All right, so that's, that's what I was thinking about earlier in the day. Um, and I've also realized that I missed out on, on a particular Seiko release, which, which I found kind of cool, uh, mostly because... One of them is a take on the turtle, and the other one is a take on the Arnold, which uh, is, of course, our favorites. Um, what one of one of our idols on this uh, channel? Um, the I'm always afraid, even though I I can get the actual German pronunciation right. I still, well, perhaps for that reason. I have a hard time saying his uh, last name. It's just uh, sounds like something else <laughs> in English. But yeah, you everyone knows Arnold, especially when you see this hybrid watch that is uh, that belongs today to the line that Seiko calls Prospects Solar. It is a diver's watch, but it is also a digital watch. Uh, that is expressed at the 12 o'clock part of the of the dial. And finally, um, the petrol color accents or the green accents, I think, are are quite amazing on this. I love the fact that they added that for the first 15 minutes of the timing bezel, which... Uh, looks quite amazing, and you know it's always something functional when it comes to when it comes to uh, rotational bezels uh, in the context of a diver's watch. Right, that that fifteen minutes is is a vital period of time underwater as well. Otherwise, of course, it gets all the aesthetics of the classical piece right. Just those two shades of blue on the dial with a darker shade of blue for the rubber strap. And there's also an SRPJ35K1, which, as far as I remember, makes this watch made in Korea. I need to brush up on some of my Seiko knowledge. I feel like I'm, I'm slipping a little bit. But as far as I know, J's are most certainly, that's what I hunt down for always. 
those are the ones made in Japan, usually J1 uh, at the end. K1, I think, refers to the non-Japanese origin of the watch, but where um, it is actually made, I don't know. Of course, this piece comes with an aluminum bezel and an hard lex crystal, which usually um, is the case at this price point for Seiko. And really, before their inspiration uh, by the modding community. I mean, you know, when Seiko came out with the so-called King Turtle, which is a watch that I have, um, SRP E05, they were really, in a way, cribbing from, from the modders, you know, putting a you know, putting an, uh, a ceramic bezel on their watch, putting a sapphire crystal with with a candy bar style cyclops o over the day date function. All of these things were more or less um, something that Seiko didn't really pay attention to, didn't really care before uh, people started really modding their watches in a certain way. So this is. Uh, this is the piece that I also have in my collection. Um, instead of the hard lakes crystal, it has a sapphire crystal, uh, has a kind of uh, oblong um, magnifier for the day-date function, and, of course, um, ceramic bezel, whereas uh, most Seiko divers at or around that that at or around that price range, you'll find uh, their Hardlex crystal, uh, which is actually, I mean, I, I'm always fine with it, honestly, and I do prefer aluminum bezels. You know, one of the reasons I love uh, this one, which is my original uh, SKX 007, uh, my gym watch, my pool watch, my... Uh, ocean watch is um, is its aluminum bezel. I, I think it's it's just nice. It's just nice. Basil's bezels, man. Basil is always the first to super chat. Uh, he knows how it goes, and he remembers you to put the thumbs up. Hit the like button, folks. It's it really, really does help. And by the way, I should I forgot to ask. I was I was thinking, should I should I go? Uh, I'm gonna do a poll on this. Should I go the way of Chris Moltisanti and and get a Should I go uh, Chris Moltisanti and get uh, Pasha? Should I get a Cartier Pasha? Yes. No. get something else and if you choose get something else please add it in the chat and as you are voting in the pool in the poll uh, please also hit the like button if it doesn't take too much work it's certainly for free and it does help a lot so i would appreciate that thank you thank you so much and thank you basils for for your kind help there really really does matter so we were looking at these uh earlier releases from seiko that i had missed out uh i think it's like a tropical lagoon special as you know seiko loves taking after certain elements in nature especially as they can be observed in their own habitat, you know, in, in the places 
where they have their workshops, though that's not always the case. They also have a very uh, concerted campaign with the Save the Oceans heading. Um, but, you know, of course, this doesn't really belong there. The SRPJ 35K1 uh, runs on the 4R36 caliber, um, is water resistance. is water resistant up to 200 meters. And I think it has a power reserve of, you know, for 42 hours or so. Don't, don't quote me on that, but I think that should be around the range of that particular movement. Uh, of course, we're talking about a stainless steel piece on a stainless steel bracelet, uh, 45 millimeters in diameter, 13.42 in thickness. Uh, the cushion case Seiko divers actually wear quite well, if you ask me. Um, my turtle is also supposed to be quite large, but I think it, it wears really well, especially on that rubber strap uh, that it comes with. Um, I, I like the Seiko divers. I mean, it's, it's just the ultimate beat around, all-purpose watch. They might list nowadays for four, five, six hundred dollars $600, but if you just put on a few keywords on eBay, certainly, you know, in a couple of weeks, you'll wake up to a deal uh, that's probably 30, 40% of that. Uh, I've gotten most of my Seiko watches no more than $300. The only Seiko watches that I practically paid in full uh, was the entire set of Seiko 5 rowing blazers that I bought and that I'm giving away. As you know, the orange one is already gone. And I just pulled this out of, of the storage, the lime green dial. That is going to be going to the lucky winner of the February raffle. As I mentioned, uh, every single person who super chats first in a live stream and last gets a number, uh, gets a unique number. So every time you do that, you get another number, an additional number. Um, and since we were, we had the fundraising efforts earlier, uh, last Friday specifically. For that stream and that stream only, everyone who super chatted was entered into the raffle. And uh, every single penny and more from those super chats went directly to the UNICEF, uh, designated specifically to children in Syria and Turkey. And you know, you can check the community page to to see the receipts and, of course, the end of that live stream on Friday as well is, is a great way to do that. So, Basil's Bezels got number 36 today. We'll see who will become number 37 uh, by being the last um, Super Chat. But, hey, in the meantime, feel free to uh, address your questions to me. Uh, with a super chat so uh, by all means shamba basher says i'm listening but i should be asleep uh yes shamba basher you were the last yesterday and uh, i can confirm that you have number 35 you can also just go to the community page and the third from last post is actually uh, the one 
that has uh, the announcement and every single number. Um, of course, everyone who is listed there is listed with their uh, YouTube names. So no one is actually being exposed in or doxed in any way. All right, so going back to the Seiko divers, um, they have this kind of uh, petrol green or uh, teal kind of colored accent, both uh, for the first 15 minutes of the fully graduated uh, rotational unidirectional uh, timing bezel, but also for the minute hand itself too, which creates, I think, a very lovely, pardon me, very lovely uh, effect. And you know what? At least uh, in well-lit conditions, I don't know, I've never used uh, this kind of uh, diver in, in an actual diving setting, snorkel or scuba. Um, but I can imagine the accent can't necessarily hurt. Uh, the contrast might actually help. Um, nevertheless, it, it looks pretty cute. It looks cool. Uh, and that is the self-winding piece in the classic uh, Seiko turtle shape, uh, the cushion-shaped diver in the SRP J35 K1. And then they also have an anode, uh, which is the hybrid uh, tuna can piece, which is the SNJ 039P1. And essentially, the accents remain the same. Again, you have a blue and green aluminum bezel and the hardlex crystal over the dial. The case is a combination of stainless steel and black plastic. Of course, uh, this is a much bigger case, although the thickness remains pretty much the same, 47 0.8 millimeters in diameter and 13.8 in thickness. Once again, um, 200 meters of a depth rating. And the prices, as far as I can see, uh, should be. 525 for the turtle. And then and you can find it for cheaper, of course. Uh, and then also 525 for the Arnie as well, five five twenty five for both Arnie and and the turtle in this tropical lagoon edition. The tuna comes on the navy rubber strap, and the turtle actually comes on the stainless steel matching bracelet. No, thank you, Shamba. Thank you. That's That was amazing. Um, next up, next up, we have actually quite a fascinating thing that I just came across on a YouTube ad which shows you how aggressive they are going with this particular um, particular brands. Uh, Norcain ship with NHLPA, which is of course the Players Association uh, of the National Hockey League, um, and it's basically a kind of um, black and white version of their of their wild one. 
with a sort of double branding with Norcane at 12 o'clock, NHLPA at 6 o'clock. Apparently, it's a limited run of, of 300 pieces. I have not been able to uh, actually locate it and find it because their link directs you to actually to some other wild one watch. Um, nevertheless, I really love the dial design. You know, it. I guess I don't need to try to explain what it what it looks like. But for those of you who are only listening, it is actually supposed to look like an ice rink uh, with with all uh, those scratches and uh, tracks from the skates. Um, I don't necessarily have vocabulary for this, guys. I I love watching uh hockey but you know i haven't grown up in this country so i don't always have the right words to explain the sport to relate to the sport so i apologize if that's not uh going well but as you might know um this particular series the wild one uh specifically is supposed to be their innovative uh sports watch it incorporates uh, their uh, proprietary material called Nortec, um, which of which the primary advantage is, of course, its lightness. Um, a watch like this is supposed to weigh only half as much as uh, their own stainless steel watches. Uh, you basically have two parts of, of what they call uh, Nortec uh, cage uh, with a titanium container in between. So those are the three essential parts of the case as they come together. And um, with the rubber elements uh, and, and the case construction, ultimately it's supposed to be uh, extra shock resistance, resistant, um, I mean, honestly, I have not been really captured by by the aesthetic of these watches. Um, you know, the design itself doesn't really appeal to me. The dials usually seem to me a little contrived. You know, it, it does seem to me for the most part that they're trying a little too hard. This scratched ice or scratched ice rink uh, kind of uh, feel on on a polar white dial actually is quite muted, and it really reminds me actually of uh, those uh, old school lacquered Rolex dials uh, that develop these cracks that uh, some vintage dealers love calling a spider dial just so they can slap uh, premium on it. Um, but hey, uh, here it, it actually is made that way. It makes sense with the NHL quest, uh, connection. And in, in white, it somehow looks very charming. My, um, my one gripe with with Norcane. And again, I know that they have been collaborating with uh, Kinesi. And Kinesi, of course, makes movements for Tudor, makes movements for uh, Breitling, uh, makes movements for Cartier, uh, among others, and for Norcane as well. Uh, but the pricing on these, on this Wild One series, uh, that's 5,000 plus, it's, it's dangerous territory, really. Uh, you know, we give a lot of flack to, um, to Oris specifically in, in their uh, attempt to upmarket themselves. Norcane is certainly on that, on that same path, right? The idea is really to, um, to price watches uh, 
as if, <laughs> right? And and a lot of times, listen, uh, we are caught up uh, or we are taken by this rhetoric of, of material experimentation, by this uh, idea of uh, introducing this little technology here, uh, an in-house or manufacturer caliber there. Uh, this is how they justify uh, the immense uh, price jumps or uh, the very high pricing when they introduce a new line. Um, and I understand again. This is the this is kind of a composite material that they worked on, and it's something that they present in in various colors, and not only all black. Uh, more power to them, but uh, you know, as strong as their marketing is, and as as much as most uh, of the models on their website seem to be sold out. Um, I still remain a little bit uh, skeptical about the whole project, uh, which just seems to me a little overpriced for for what they are offering. But that's just me. That's just me. Someone else might actually love it, uh, you know, for for how, how light it is, for how it looks, for the originality of the dial designs, um, and the kind of following and, and people that they have been cultivating around them. I mean, uh, Jean-Claude Biva became a consultant for them, specifically uh, for this particular uh, product line, for the wild one. Uh, and you can kind of see, I mean, this looks like um, like a hublot for for the twenty first century with all with all due respect to hublot and Norcane and everyone else involved. Um, the movement is the n n twenty uh, slash one, which is a Kenisi manufacturer caliber. Uh, it is it is a modern, robust sports watch movement, um, which beats at four hertz, twenty eight thousand eight hundred vibrations per hour, which is chronometer certified, um, which also. Let me see actually whether this is used in in any other watches or is it. Is it simply simply a caliber, a Kenisi caliber? Yeah, okay. So it's basically the same same logic as yeah, it is the same logic as the as the Breitling Super Ocean. Heritage, if I'm not mistaken, right? It basically takes a Tudor caliber and customizes it uh, without really changing much about it. You know, basically customizing the bridge, customizing the oscillating weight, and building on the Tudor uh, MT5602, which is, of course, the caliber that you can find in the entire. Uh, Heritage Black Bay series, as well as I think the Pelagos FXDs too. Yeah. Yeah. Pelagos FXD, um, Black Bay Heritage, Black Bay 58. Wait a second. I think Black Bay 58 has a different, different caliber. Yeah, sorry. Black Bay 58s have, have the 5400. My bad. Uh, 
So, yeah, Professor and I talked about this a few times before. It really, um, it's in a way inescapable, right? At the end of the, at the end of the day, they are trying their best to to play their cards, escaping that dreaded thirty five hundred zone, right? Uh, where more or less the uh, smartwatch has cannibalized the entire market. So for watches that cost more than a thousand dollars and less than thirty five hundred or four thousand dollars, it's been a bloodbath in the recent years, in the last few years, especially um, every good sign we have heard about the high luxury market, uh, even before the crisis, even at the best of times, um, can or might have blinded us to this fact. But honestly, when it comes to the entry level Swiss luxury watch, uh, things have been actually pretty dire, and, and that's why you see a lot of more or less reasonable, more or less justifiable price increases when it comes to brands like Takoya, like Tudor, like Omega, uh, like Oris, and, and like Norkane. Right Again, I don't know how they necessarily justify these price increases to their own fan base, in this case, it must be the uh, unique experimentation with material, Nortec, and so on and so forth. Um, if you don't buy into that, if you don't buy into this design, it's very hard for me to um, encourage anyone to get a 5K plus watch uh, from you know, a brand that looks cool that's that's really you know um not a known quantity i mean let's let's put it like this simply um you know you can you can hear all sorts of stories of people uh who have gotten like you know uh a rolex as a gift and because they they thought you know it was cool uh bon et merci as as a personal watch for themselves you know for right around the same money in late 70s or something or 80s and um you know i'm sure the person who has the bon et merci from the 80s now unless there are very beautiful uh, pleasant memories attached to that watch uh, is not feeling really good right now about that particular decision and uh don't don't take me wrong. I'm not talking about uh, the investment aspect of the watch at all, at least not in the first place. But as much as most people want to uh, dismiss it, want to avoid that conversation, the luxury watch game is at some level about making a statement. Uh, so if you put a watch on your wrist that costs a penny more than $500, more than a grand, trust me, you are trying to say something to people around you when you put that watch on. Um, so I, I kind of laugh sometimes out loud, uh, but a lot of times I laugh inside when when people in the watch community say, well, I don't care about what others think of, of what I, you know, what I wear, what I, what I choose, you know, what watch, uh, what kinds of watches I collect. Um, you do care. You do care, especially uh, those of you who have Instagram accounts, who are on YouTube, who, who are involved in the watch community in one way or another. Of course you care. Uh, and I do too. Uh, so it means a lot that people recognize what you are wearing in one way or another. If it is some sort of an obscure kind of recognition, probably even better. But 
essentially when it comes to brands like Norcane, we're talking about, um, and Oris too, we are talking about brands that are experiencing some sort of revival without really knowing where that revival will go. Aussie expat. Well, revival in Norris's, uh, Oris's case, uh, ascendance in Norcane's case, because Norcane is not a brand that existed previously. It's actually a pretty young one. Uh, thank you so much, Ozzy. And jump on if you, if you have a little bit of time. I would appreciate that. So, yeah, that's the wild one series from Norcane that is built uh, partly of that proprietary uh, material they have they call Nortec that's the case of the watch and there's a titanium container um, in which you have the beating hearts of uh, Tudor's manufacturer caliber basically uh, 5602 which is um, reprised here as NN20 slash 1. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, they are uh, partners in Kenisi, uh, as uh, Chanel is a partner in Kenisi, as is Tudor a partner in Ken Kenisi, as is Breitling, so on and so forth. So uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not holding that against them. Um, but you know, unless you're really in love with that particular uh, piece of design, um, I wouldn't recommend that you go out and uh, plonk down more than $5,000 for a watch like this. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely understandable, man. Good luck. Good luck. My best wishes. Yeah, so we started with... Um, YouTube just put in front of me this uh, cool dial they did for the partnership that they had accomplished with uh, NHLPA in 2020. Uh, the Players Association of the National Hockey League. And uh, I, I really do love the dial of this watch, don't take me wrong. Whether I would, uh, you know, in any scenario, put down five grand for, for a watch like this, absolutely not. But uh, I like that kind of uh, scratched ice uh, pattern which is uh, very authentic, but also at the same time quite reminiscent of, of those cracked lacquer dials uh, that you find in neo vintage uh, Rolex watches, specifically, you know, watches from, from the 80s. A lot of subs from the 80s have this uh, faulty painting or defected painting, you can say, perhaps that has uh, reacted in that particular way. Uh, speaking brands that are trying to make the, their mark in, in one way or another uh, in the horological space, I think Louis Vuitton is, is a very important uh, one. Now, uh, you know, Bulgari's uh, horological ascendance more or less coincides with the acquisition of, of Bulgari um, in, I think it was 20, 20, 2011 by LVMH. Um, that was a, I think that was a good deal for Bulgari. Honestly, I'm not, uh, I'm not necessarily uh, criticizing that. Um, not only did the family make a lot of money out of it, but I think they also got a nice chunk of, of uh, steak. Um, uh, S-T-A-K-E. Um, 
out of the deal, I think, to the measure of maybe 3.5%, which is not too bad, you know, thinking about the entire empire that, that Louis Vuitton actually established. Uh, this is a piece that is once again from SJX, this time written solely by Matthew Lopez. Uh, good job, Matthew. Thank you again. Um, they have just celebrated, as you know, the 20th uh, anniversary of the tambour, uh, that particular design, and they reprised it in a chronograph uh, that was based on the Zenit El Primero caliber 400. Of course, uh, that was also the first um, kind of uh, serious Louis Vuitton branded watch that they built. Louis Vuitton has been also silently making moves um, in terms of the acquisitions that, that they were making, kind of trying to build... Um, trying to build a vertically integrated system, more or less. Um, around the same time they acquired, around the same time LVMH acquired uh, Bulgari, they, Louis Vuitton acquired a complications workshop uh, called uh, La Fabrique du Temps. Um, you know, think of it as something like like APRP, right? Like uh, Renault et Papy, uh, kind of a boutique establishment that develops high complications for um, for brands, for other brands, outsources uh, this kind of stuff. So La Fabrique du Temps was up until that time. Um, a workshop, a movement specialist that uh, basically built uh, these sorts of complications for Hublot, uh, for uh, Speak Marin, uh, for Ralph Lauren, um, for Laurent Ferrier, and also uh, for everyone's favorite brand, of course, uh, Jacob and Co. as well. So they were behind, especially a lot of, a lot of tourbillon uh, pieces, especially uh, a tourbillon minute repeater for Speak Marin, uh, the Cyclone tourbillon for for uh, Jacob and Co. Um, Ralph Lauren's first tourbillon uh, that was introduced in 2013, so on and so forth. Um, Essentially, LVMH acquired uh, La Fabrique du Temps and, and pretty much built uh, it as part of its, its manufacture. Uh, they have integrated uh, in 2012 uh, Le Mans uh, Cadran into the uh, structure, uh, Le Mans being the French name for Lake Geneva, right? Uh, Lac Le Mans. Lac, uh, Lac Le Mans uh, is the French name for Lake Geneva. So uh, Le Mans uh, Cadran was also integrated into uh, their uh, manufacture. And I think uh, they basically built their manufacture around these two establishments basically um in in Mayran, apparently that's the that's the place i haven't been there so i can't i can't really speak to the geography of the situation but here is uh the piece the minute repeater they have made uh for 200 years uh so Jacques Mar is is uh, the name of their founder. They are basically celebrating uh, the 200th birthday of their founder um, with this watch. That is exactly the kind of piece which can be built 
by the expertise of, of their complications specialist, uh, La Fabrique du Temps. It's basically a one of a kind. Apparently, it's not going to be even a limited uh, edition. I'm not sure if it's e e even going to be for sale. Um, it's basically a minute repeater and it has an automaton. Let's see uh, what it actually plays in a little bit. Uh, and the dial is, is an enamel painting in miniature by the famous Anita Porche, uh, who is probably uh, the most famous um, living artist who does these sorts of micro paintings uh, in, in enamel. Apparently the watch is 48 uh, millimeters in diameter and it's been uh, two years in development. A kind of translucent blue uh, enamel on the dial that uh, brings uh, a kind of uh, sci-fi scene into action. I think the slide of the minute repeater is set with what to me looks like uh, aquamarines, but I might be wrong. And And let's see what it's what it actually does on the dial. Apparently, this is an 18 karat white gold case, um, or rather, it is middle and back in titanium. I'm supposing that's for uh, resonance purposes, right? Uh, chiming watches actually sound you can't say objectively better, but certainly louder in titanium than they do uh, with precious metal cases, which are, I think, warmer and uh, possibly also, you know, louder and, and more clear. And I guess subjectively, you can say better as well. Uh, whereas the bezel, the lugs, and, and the slide of, of that you use to activate the repeater are in white gold. So you have that sort of uh, luxury metal integrated into, into the base of the case, which is in titanium. Um, it has a power reserve of 100 hours, which I don't know what it actually means for a minute repeater. You know, because the power hungry part of a minute repeater is the complication, is the chiming. Uh, so it's sometimes better to count it in terms of how many times it can chime what, but we'll take that as red. Uh, this is how the movement looks. Those uh, bridges. I don't know what the metal of it is. Maybe also it's blue titanium. I don't know, but certainly uh, the blue is pretty striking on those uh, bridge plates of the 
hand wound movement. And it, the article actually doesn't mention, doesn't specify what those um, graduated blue baguette cut uh, gems are. I'm guessing possibly sapphire and uh, aquamarine, but I might be wrong as well. Let's see if, if we can actually see a price and and also uh, see, yes, approximately 1 million, but it's already sold anyways, okay? Minute repeater with cathedral gongs and the automaton. Let's see if this little video has, has anything for us. Well, at least it shows the automaton. That's pretty cool. I mean, it's a little um, not cool enough for for one million dollars, but still pretty cool and cute. I I like the kind of glamorous sci-fi look honestly i can't can't complain can't complain it's pretty cool it's pretty cute i have to say and this is a louis vuitton tambour uh, jacquemart minute repeater 200 years um it's celebrating the birth of uh, Louis Vuitton, uh, the founder, not uh, necessarily the brand. I think um, I think Louis Vuitton was founded maybe yeah. 1850s, you know, like mid 19th century. I don't remember the exact date, but yeah. And Jacquemart refers apparently to to the automaton, and they actually had an automaton watch before in this uh, Carpe Diem piece that was also a tambour, uh, and this is. Uh, at quite another level altogether, especially since it um, combines that minute repeater function with, with a kind of automaton. Um, so that was that was the 200 years uh, tambour Jacquemart, uh, which is a way, again, as I mentioned, usually about these kinds of pieces, it's a way of them for them to flex their muscles you know it's not about how much how many uh, how many they can sell and how much they would go for it's about kind of demonstrating uh, that they have the horological expertise that they have the facilities to build in house a chiming watch build in house pardon me um an automaton watch build in-house a certain kind of complication. And uh, frankly, I don't know how the two brands will uh, mix. But uh, as you guys know, uh, Jean, uh, Jean Arnaud is uh, basically one of the heirs uh, of, of the whole... Uh, family uh, fortune and the family um, business, so to speak. Um, son of uh, Bernard Arnaud, uh, he leads um, basically the watchmaking division uh, of, um, of Louis Vuitton. And the Daniel Roth brand also has been given 
over to his control. So I don't know how, you know, at what stage they are for that revival. Um, I don't know what they're exactly going to do with the brand. I don't know if it's going to be a kind of deal where you have, where you used to have, for example, a double branding when these brands were in Bulgari's hands. You would have like, you know, Daniel Roth Bulgari or a Bulgari branded Daniel Roth watch uh, or uh, Bulgari Jarajanta. Uh, more recently, when Bulgari revived the Jarajanta brand, even though they sell them, it's not necessarily branded Bulgari. So we'll see what the relationship between Louis Vuitton's watches be with, with Daniel Roth, but I know, I know for a fact that um, Daniel Roth was now passed on to LV and passed on to Jean Arnaud's control rather than uh, being a part of uh, Bulgari's uh, watch division, which I think is actually a significant news. I, I keep repeating this, you know, Daniel Roth, uh, whether... You know, whether you like uh, his particular approach, his design aesthetic, uh, or even what he did uh, in Breguet uh, is really one of the pioneers and one of the underrated pioneers of independent watchmaking for this particular era. Um, yes, George Daniels has written the book uh, on uh, the art of Breguet. Yes, George Daniels uh, actually made a lot of uh, pocket watches and a couple of wristwatches as well entirely by hand. Uh, yes, uh, you know, F.B. Jean perhaps uh, is um, the one to entirely break into the mainstream. Yes, uh, Philippe Dufour and Kari Boutilainen have this uh, sort of uh, supra political uh, status of of uh, grand grand ayatollahs of of watchmaking, um, but nevertheless, Daniel Roth uh, actually went his own way in 1989, and before that, he was busy establishing uh, that whole uh, postmodern Breguet aesthetic uh, that is basically the backbone of the design language that you see in every single independent. So for, for the brands to be revived is important and for specifically for, uh, for the name to be used without any involvement from Daniel Roth, I think it's pretty significant. There you go. This is the Instagram account with their uh, single post. And uh, we already have, have some wonderful people commenting to the post. What's the sense of a Daniel Roth if it's not from Daniel Roth? Uh, I would actually slightly adjust that question, right? The, what's the sense of of Daniel Roth brand if you don't have any involvement from Daniel Roth, right? It's, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like with Gerard Janta, it's, it was a little different, I think, because he had passed away in 2011. So when Bulgari releases watches now, you can classify it in, in some sort of, uh, you can classify them as some sort of homage, especially when they actually put uh, the Gerard Janta name uh, on the dial. And I hope uh, they also do that in amicable and preferable terms uh, with the family and with Evelyn Janta, specifically uh, Gerard Janta's widow. Um, the Daniel Roth project, I don't really understand because... Daniel Roth is alive and well. I know he doesn't run an industrial or mass production brand, but he he does have um, his his own brand where he makes a handful of watches. 
Um, and the, there's a whole archive of Danny Ross' work that needs to be honored a certain way. I, I hope they they pay some dues to him, uh, at least in respect, right? As the as the famous verse goes, right? You know, I don't need the money, pay me in respect. So I hope they at least at least do something about it um, in a way that uh, that honors. honors the actual founder, the namesake of the brand. Um, Danny Roth's own brand is uh, JDN, basically, uh, Jean-Daniel Nicolas, um, after his wife and son, or sons, perhaps? I, I don't know. Maybe he also has a son with the name Daniel. Anyway. I think it's it's his wife, his name, and his son's name. So that's the that's the actual brand, which has uh, Daniel Roth at the helm. All right. So next, uh, we are gonna go and take a look at some of the fine watches that Sotheby's has to offer for their upcoming New York auction. And there you go. You have one of my favorites, Saxonias, the Zaxomat in platinum before 2000 as well, which makes this watch very, very important and very interesting. This is, um, it has that, uh, oversized micro rotor in 21 karat gold with an extra supplemental platinum weight, a uh, very beautiful aesthetic. And it's also, of course, pre Richemont 1999. That could be a great deal to get uh, platinum Lange uh, pre Richemont with a caliber that they don't use anymore. Not that I have, not that there's anything wrong with, with the full rotor um, caliber that they use right now for, for the Zaxo mounts, but there's something about this aesthetic that I really like. I always like micro rotor calibers, but as always, you know, Lange kind of went its own way and, and did something uh in excess so i i really really enjoy this this is the lot one from the march 7 uh auction in sotheby's new york a reference 308 025 zaxomat platinum self-winding piece from lange Even with, uh, look at this. I mean, this is archival material. 1999 dates, uh, Walter Lange's personal signature, stamped by the famous Cellini in New York on Madison. What a piece. The estimate is 10 to 15,000. I don't know. It's coming home. It's coming home. It's coming to New York. I don't know what kind of interest it, there would be on it. The dial is extremely balanced, of course. You have those uh, classic alpha hands that are filled with loom. Um, the pips behind the index markers as well, which are doubled at, at 12, uh, 3, and 9, and abbreviated at 6 since you have, again, a very oversized small seconds dial, which ultimately, I think, comes out very balanced since the oversized date is very much the aesthetic of, of this watch as well. You see the stepped lugs of the platinum case. This must be a delight to wear. 
full set with that uh, archival document, basically. 37 millimeters, I think just the perfect um, proportions for this sort of platinum dress watch. You see this subtlety of that uh, pusher, which allows you to shuffle through the date, of course, that oversized date. My God, what, what, a, what a beautiful piece. The, with the 920.4 caliber. The estimate they give here is ten to $15,000. Though, again, I'm guessing in New York, probably this will be, this will be snapped in a pretty interesting way. The immediate example that we have, of course, is the... is the Mark Cho special that they sold. I think that was in yellow gold. Um, let me see. I want to say that was... Or was it... Did it have that movement? I'm not sure. Okay, let me see if we have any examples of that on, on Chrono 24, for example. Case material. I highly doubt it. There are only like three. Ooh. Yeah, unfortunately, the only one that we have is so-called Darth version of the of the platinum uh, Zaxonia, but this is not a Zaxomat. It's actually a hand wound piece so um, it's not comparable horologically it's certainly not comparable in terms of the collectability because people go crazy about uh, the so-called stealth versions which are uh, which have this uh, subtle uh, silvered expression and non-luminous or these darth versions which have black dials and and black background uh, with uh, white printed date. So the pricing on this would not be comparable to, to what we will see here, but I'm, I'm very curious as to how this will perform in auction. Um, again, not, nothing historically unique, uh, nothing impossibly rare, but it is an artifact of a bygone era for a brand that has gained a lot in value in the recent years. So that was lot number one, uh, Alain Gonzune, uh, Zaxomat, uh, with the older micro rotor movements in platinum, uh, great aesthetic, and pre Richemont as well. At two, we have the oversized Lange one, which is a 40. Hey, Van Lux, nice to see you, man. Which is a 41 millimeter version of the classic 38.5. As you see, uh, even in black dial versions, usually you have the oversized dates with a white background, black numerals uh, so those black background ones are pretty rare still I think this is a fantastic aesthetic white gold piece in this case with that German silver three quarter plates the older movement
2017. Great, great piece as well with the L095.1 movement. I think the movement is, is a little, I think it's updated now, but I'm not sure if there is any significant thing that affects its operation. It certainly still has a three-day power reserve, which is proudly indicated here. Uh, power reserve 72 hours and of course the power reserve indicator is on the dial as well practically an enlarged version of the Lange one without changing much of its aesthetics uh, here at 10 o'clock you also have the pusher to actually set the dates and for number two lot number two you have an estimated uh, value of 15 to 25,000 US dollars. Number three is uh, Laurent Ferrier Tourbillon. Nice. This is the Galet Classic Tourbillon double spiral. A platinum piece with double balance spring. You gotta love the aesthetic details as well here. The ruby on the, I'm guessing it's a ruby on that uh, onion crown. And then the accents that match the shade of that color on the small seconds sub dial at six and you can have a very nice glimpse onto the tourbillon from from the backside The anglage is pretty good as well. And there's some extra uh, decoration on the case on the back as well, as it would befit a watch like this in platinum, of course. I guess that's the original strap. And you also have a new strap with the matching clasp, which I hope actually match the case material, which is uh, one of my pet peeves as, as you all know. I don't think they say that. No, it's, it's a white gold buckle, man. Ah. <sighs> I'll never understand that. And no, I will, I will never be convinced that somehow there's a manufacturing justification for it. This is lot three. The Laurent Ferrier classic tourbillon double spiral. Platinum piece with a double balance spring from around five years ago. The estimated value is sixty to $80,000. I'm going to also send you guys um, the link to this auction. So if you want to direct my attention to any specific lots, feel free to send it in with the Super Chat. And I will do my best to get back to you. 
lot number four is the New York edition of of the pilot Calatrava watches, which have just been discontinued in their dual time version. Um, as you know, the 5524 G and R was just removed from, just recently removed from Patek Philippe's catalog. Uh, when those watches were first introduced, um, Patek actually made a New York edition uh, as a three-hander uh, with exclusively for the U.S. market uh, in 2017. As you see, a very puristic, simple design uh, replicating that pilot watch aesthetic, uh, slapping a small movement in an oversized case, which is signature contemporary Patek Philippe, uh, more power to them. They can slap any movement into anything and people will keep buying. It's not their fault. I mean, this is a pretty nice style. It's hard to recognize anything Patek about this particular watch. And quite frankly, these watches in this version, which has been pretty limited in number, or in the dual time version, which has been otherwise really desirable, uh, they're not really selling too well. So we'll see how this performs. Um, the estimated value is 20 to 30 thousandths. Uh, this is also a stainless steel watch. Um, again, all these things that can make it quite desirable. Otherwise, it's 42 millimeters. You don't find 42 millimeter uh, Calatrava style pieces every day. Um, but some of the recent examples have not really performed really well. I'm trying to dig up in the background how many pieces of it were made. 600 pieces were made. So it's not, it's not impossibly limited, but still quite limited in number. We'll see how it goes. Oh, this is a cool one. Uh, 50, 70 in platinum. Also an absolute unit of a watch, of course. Um, 5070 has a particular uh, place, you have to say, in, in Patek uh, lore and in Patek Philippe's uh, archive, so to speak, because, because of the size of the watch itself, which is 42 millimeters, but also um, because it is the last reference uh, that actually runs on an iteration of, of the Lemania CH27 caliber. Um, 5170 was uh, the first uh, version of the CH29 base calibers, which are Patek's version uh, of an in-house hand-wound chronograph movement. 5070 is also important because it was introduced, I think, towards the end of the 90s, probably 1998. Um, and it was basically the first serial production uh, hand-wound Patek chronograph after the discontinuation of the legendary reference 1463 Tasti Tondi, uh, which was, you might say, uh, Patek's version of a sports watch at the time, right? It was uh, this sort of classic design um, with a waterproof uh, case produced by François Borgel. Uh, so a very important uh, piece in its time and still 
uh, still one of the one of the most desired vintage collectibles in the Patek Philippe uh, catalog. Uh, but that production had stopped uh, in 1965. So until 5070 came, Patek actually did not have um, a piece similar to this, just a hand-wound uh, classic chronograph. Of course, it had perpetual calendar chronographs that built on this base of, of uh, Limania CH27, uh, but 5070 was um, actually a very different kind of beast. Um, this is also from around 2009, which is quite towards the end of, of the production. I think Frank Lampard has has one of these uh, exactly in this configuration, platinum with with that deep blue dial. It's 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 a cracking watch. I mean, too big for my taste, but certainly something that that has its part to play uh, in in Patek Philippe lore. Um, you can see how uh, they are cheating, of course, a little bit uh, with the chronograph seconds track there uh, in which they put uh, the tachometer. They have to fill up the space on that dial for the 42 millimeter case. But hey, again, they do something different once every so often and, and that's cool as long as, as, long as that's that doesn't become their character, which is uh, how how it's kind of developed in the last few years. Who cares? But this is uh, this is certainly one of those pieces where it actually sits right because it strays out of the norm. Uh, this is 5070P, quite late in its production, uh, lot number five. Sotheby's expects this to fetch somewhere between 80,000 to 120,000 US dollars in the upcoming live auction in New York on March 7. Chris says 5070 is better than 5170 for me. I can agree with that. I can agree with that. Um, again, it's too large for my personal taste, but that does not in any way uh, diminish its historical importance, which is again, uh, in many ways, unmatched. Right? You get you get an oversized chronograph. Uh, you get Patek's last take uh, on on the classic uh, Lemania CH27, which is basically the chronograph caliber that defined, you might say, the 20th century. Um, so it's it's certainly that sort of piece, you know that that belongs to, I think, a serious uh, Patek collectors um, spread, um, especially if that person is interested in chronographs. Speaking of that, uh, number six lot number six is that. Uh, 5170p with uh, baguette diamonds for the indices. And you have that uh, kind of uh, gradient dark blue dial again. A very striking piece as well. Smaller in size than, than the earlier piece. This one, of course, uh, has the Patek Philippe seal, whereas the 5070 will have the Geneva seal, right? Since it was still in that age. This is a much more recent piece, even though nowadays the 5172 uh, has taken up the mantle, has been passed on the torch but you can see from the estimated value how um, 
special in a way, the 5070 is. Uh, this piece has an estimated value of fifty to eighty thousand dollars. That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it will be sold for less than lot five, the fifty seventy p, but probably. Um, this is at forty millimeters. I think much more wearable. Uh, to me, uh, still an exquisitely beautiful watch. But for a collector's sake, you know, if you are uh, rolling uh, in these deep waters, uh, I would I would very much say go for lot five, which is uh, much more rare and much more historically significant. Whereas lot number six is just stunningly beautiful and i think a great watch to wear period but you know who knows uh you know how it will um trend compared to the 5070 p which is nothing like what comes after it it's the end of an era in many ways This is the 5070P. You can see the Geneva seal there. Yeah. And, you know, CH27 is a beautiful, beautiful movement. Classic architecture. Uh, the column wheel is hiding there under the screw. Okay, I don't know why I'm stuck in the loop of, of this. Okay, now we're back. Another watch that was just discontinued from Patek's catalog. I don't know what kind of, you know, collaboration, let's say, allegedly, we have here between uh, Patek Philippe and, and this um, these auction houses, but another beautiful watch, another watch that was just discontinued just removed from the Patek Philippe catalog, the 5271P, which is the platinum uh, version of Patek's uh, famous perpetual calendar chronograph that is also diamond set uh, with baguette diamonds on the bezel and also... The lugs are diamond set as well. I love that lug design, by the way, the kind of arachnoid or arachnoid, I guess you say in English, uh, spider-like lugs. You see once again, of course, a movement that's now based in uh, on the CH29 caliber, uh, a heavy hitter again in platinum. And this case kind of splits the difference between 50 and and 50, uh, 50, 50, 70 and 5170 since this is 41 millimeters, 5170 being 40, 5070 being 42 millimeter in diameter. Uh, matte black dial, a very striking watch, of course, uh, running seconds at nine. Uh, pointer date and moon phase at 6, 30-minute totalizer at 3, uh, day and night indicator at, um, what, 7.5, uh, leap year indicator at 4.5. And, and lot 7 is expected to fetch a final hammer price between 225000 to 425000 in U.S. dollars. Wow. Number eight is actually one of uh, one of the f my favorite watches to grace the Patek Philippe catalog in recent years. This is the fifty. 740G, a perpetual calendar version 
of uh, Patek's famous sports model in white gold. It's quite a watch, uh, especially uh, because it combines that sort of heft uh, that is old, of course, to a white gold piece with a full matching bracelet. But it's also quite slender uh, owing to that uh, micro rotor caliber 240 based uh, perpetual calendar movement. It's really a fantastic piece. And this part, this piece has an estimated value of 160,000 to 240,000 US dollars. It's the it's Patek Philippe uh, Extravaganza, the first 13, and all quite interesting as well. Uh, number nine is the famous uh, travel time Aquanaut, uh, which was a lot of a lot of firsts for for the Aquanaut uh, specifically. It has that uh, enlarged gold case. Um, Right, which is bigger than the jumbo, uh, especially the 42 millimeter, uh, 50, 51, 68 uh, G models have become quite popular in blue and, and in green. But this piece, um, was meant to highlight uh, the travel time pushers, which advance uh, the hands back, the hour hand back and forth, um, and also introduced the travel time complication to the Aquanaut case. And you can basically move the basically move the primary hour hand and, and set the skeletonized uh, with with the crown. Uh, this was the advanced research piece, quite quite limited in terms of access and in terms of number. Uh, 5650, of course, again, you have that double um, AM, PM indicator, double day and night indicator for the local time and the home time as well. And the cutouts specifically um, display how these pushers engaged so they have some sort of a purpose i call this watch the terminator you know kind of that arnold scene where uh, his machinery is exposed for no particular reason to say hey uh, there's a machine under this um you know <laughs> uh, seemingly android person um anyway this is this doesn't make me hot but since it's so rare uh, and since it's an advanced research piece, it's exactly the kind of piece that would hit exorbitant amounts in an auction. Though I also wouldn't be surprised, you know, if they don't find the right buyer for a piece like this, they might have a hard time moving it at half a million dollars. So we'll see. But this is lot nine with an estimated value of 400 to 600 US dollars. Number 10, this is, I, I like this particular era, the 
the 3900 series, you know, whether we are talking about 3940, uh, the perpetual calendar, pure and simple, or 3970 here, uh, 3970 EP-20, which is the perpetual calendar chronograph uh, in platinum. Um, it's, you know, the proportions are just right. They're just perfect. Um, let's dive in a little bit. This is, uh, of course, at 12 o'clock, you have the day of the week and month. Uh, you have the running seconds at, at 9 o'clock, but also a 24-hour indicator uh, that's lodged, that's nested right in that sub-dial. Uh, you have a 30-minute totalizer at 3 o'clock. I also love the fonts on this piece. Um, and lodged within that, you, had, you have the leap year indicator as well, of course. And then you have that black and white moon face for this particular piece with the black dial um, at 6 o'clock and a pointer date as well. Solid piece. Uh, very, as you can see, has a lot of heft, uh, and it's a platinum watch too, so you can expect to feel the weight. Um, and of course, this is still a movement that's based on the Lemania caliber, which you can recognize here from the back as well. There's the hallmark of Geneva, which refers to the highest standards, of course, of, uh, of the time in terms of assembly and, and finishing and quality. And this is a piece at lot 10 that has an estimated value of 80 thousand to one hundred and twenty thousand US dollars As you know, um, a lot of the platinum, a lot of the precious metal pieces of this era, and you know, um, that have this sort of complication, are both served with this kind of uh, screw down um, sapphire case back for exhibition. But the full sets actually come with uh, that additional. Uh, platinum case back, which is a snap-on, as you can see here. So you are not cheated out of the material. Number 11 is uh, basically a slightly more simplified version of what we had seen in 5271P. Uh, this is 5270R, so the perpetual calendar chronograph in pink gold uh, those lovely lugs again the 41 uh, millimeter case size uh, I think straggle, st straddling uh, both the modern and, and classic expression quite nicely uh, but is certainly more aggressive uh, in its communication, let's say, in terms of both the size and the design of the case. Uh, you have the additional snap-on case back there. And the sapphire case back for the presentation. This is lots number 11, reference 5270R. 
a Patek Philippe perpetual calendar in pink gold from roughly 2018 with an estimated value of 70,000 to 120,000. Number 12 is a pink gold annual calendar, Patek Philippe piece. Hey, JB and Chris, thank you. And yes, congratulations. Yes, you are, you, your team won the Super Bowl, uh, whatever that is. But uh, I like, I like the concert in the middle. Um, number 12. Pink gold annual calendar, as you know, uh, when Patek introduced it in it in 1996, it was their proprietary complication. It was basically a way of of simplifying, perhaps making slightly accessible, the perpetual calendar. Um, kind of a more useful complication rather than a grand complication, but certainly. And an amazing one, I think, a very utilitarian one, since uh, the only time you need to adjust uh, these things, uh, you know, as long as you keep wearing it, as long as you keep, pardon me, you keep it charged, so to speak, uh, is the end of this month. Other than that, uh, the annual calendar uh, can be left to its own devices. Um, for the rest of the year you have the date at 12 o'clock day of the week at uh, 10 and 10 and a quarter and then the month at uh, one and three quarters as well with a 24-hour indicator at, on a sub dial at six o'clock with the moon phase expressed right within it. At lot number 12, this is Patek's uh, contemporary expression of the annual calendar which has gone through a few modifications in terms of how the dial is laid out. The cases have grown bigger in time at 40 millimeters in this particular case. This piece has an estimated value of 40 to 60,000. JB, how, how are you enjoying your new strap, man? How are you enjoying the buckle? Come on the show if you would like. To, to show it off but I, I still do want that that short as well So that was number 12 and number 13 actually ends, concludes our Patek Philippe extravaganza, which they put for the first 13 uh, of this particular piece. Another perpetual calendar with a sector dial, again, um, a 24-hour uh, indicator on the sub dial which also includes the moon phase date at six o'clock and the two openings uh, at around 12 are for the day of the week and the month and again a self-winding caliber which has a yellow gold rotor in a pink gold case, which always grates me for whatever reason. This wasn't the case with lot 12, as you have seen. Nope. Oh. Oh, yeah, this is from about a decade ago. 
comes as a full set. Damn near perfect. 5396R. Pink gold self winding annual calendar with moon phase indicator and 24 hours. Lot 13 is expected to fetch an amount between 25,000 to 45,000 US dollars. By the way, I'm sure since this is in in New York, there must be some viewings for it in New York before uh, they're actually going to be um, sold. So you should check it out uh, in the auction details. But I'm going to send the link. I'm going to open the next one. Oh, great. Lovely. I'm going to open the next one and take a very short break because I need, I need a drink. I need a drink of water more than anything. Um, but I'll be right back. And feel free to, again, uh, drop in the chat if you like any particular uh, pieces if you'd like me to discuss one or the other, feel free to send it in with the super chat. Okay, we're back. Uh, some some APs lined up here, so that's pretty cool. This is uh, the 15400, which replaced the 15300 with the enlarged case in 41 millimeter, which some people love. Uh, others uh, look for either the original proportions of the jumbo or um, look for the 15300, which had a similar aesthetic, but actually with, uh, you know, in a 39 millimeter case. So the centrally deployed seconds hand is something that, that a lot of people uh, ask for and similarly, um, also the AP logo, the initial logo at 12 o'clock was something that was quite, um, quite significant for, for the 15300 as well. 15400 is a larger case, is a slightly different expression but the general outlines and the idea remains. Um, also, AP's, um, you know, AP's 
15300 for, was for the longest time the closest thing you can get to a jumbo with an in-house AP caliber, basically, uh, which only graced uh, the innards of, of uh, uh, Royal Oak Jumbo uh, just last year in 2022. Uh, Let me actually show you an example of, of what I mean rather than, rather than this. Um, since these are discontinued, by the way, they're not particularly great deals on the secondary market, to be brutally honest with you. But still, this is this used to be a cool piece. 15300 just a little bit thicker, a little slightly different uh, in terms of the bracelet buckle and everything, but still something that preserved most aspects of the uh, um, Of, of the Royal Oak design in that particular expression. Nevertheless, uh, what we have in this auction at lot 16 is one with that white dial, uh, 41 millimeters. And that's the caliber 3120. And this piece actually comes as a full set as well with the additional, with the extra links for the bracelet two. From right around 2016, this piece has an estimated value of 25 to $50,000. We have a couple of jumbos lined up next to each other, again, in stainless steel. This was a 15202 before uh, its reintroduction in the, on the 40th anniversary of the piece. You can see that on the dial because these early versions actually had uh, the AP logo at 12 o'clock rather than the traditional placing for the jumbo, which was at 6 o'clock. And then you can also tell, again, at first glance, uh, the background of the date wheel still remains white instead of the more closely color matched in the 40th anniversary edition of the 1512. Of course, the hexagonal white gold bolts have patinated uh, beautifully and taken on this yellowish hue, which contrasts really nicely with the rest of the stainless steel watch, and especially the octagonal bezel. Uh, you can see how slender the profile is from here. And of course, the rotor itself is a little different and somehow more ornate in its skeletonization, honestly. Uh, and again, you see the initials AP here. Lot 17 with the classic blue dial. has an estimated value of 70 to 90,000. It's roughly from 2010. If that one had the uh, Bleu Nuit uh, Nuage 50 dial, this is one that has a white dial. Again, uh, the 
versions of it that were produced right after 2012 also had the petite tapisserie proper where uh, the design is a little more micro rather than this um, I'm sure it is something you would notice right away this is the white dial version again right from that cut off a very nice aesthetic as well uh, clearly slightly less desirable since its estimated value is 50 to 75 thousand and of course the jumbos um, up until 2022 ran on the caliber 2121 which was uh, Jeje Le Coutre's workhouse caliber a workhorse caliber 920 which they supplied to the big uh, three high horological makers um, Audemars Piguet used in Royal Oak uh, primarily uh, Patek Philippe uh, used for the Nautilus and Vachon Constantin used for again the first generation of their 222 to this day uh, the base of this movement, JLC 920, remains the thinnest self-winding caliber with a full rotor as opposed to a micro rotor or as opposed to a peripheral rotor. This is lot 18. Two Audemars Piguet jumbos back-to-back. And next up, you have an Yves Klein offshore, uh, which is a triple calendar version, 25887. This is a piece that is made to commemorate the 1998 uh, Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan. It's a triple calendar watch built on the uh, on Emmanuel Guilly's update on the original Gerard Janta design. But nevertheless, uh, this is again from from an age, from a time where this is still relatively humble uh, and and small compared to what followed it uh, 38 millimeters still quite a unit from the um, profile as you can see its thickness that should be probably like um, maybe 15 or something let me see Yeah, I'm guessing it should be uh, 15, if not more. It's quite quite a thick watch, but at 38 millimeters, it's not it's not really large. It has that rubber crown, of course, and that bright shade of blue that was made famous by Yves Klein, uh, the well-renowned painter. And the pattern, as you see, is uh, very fine. Uh, the definition of petite tapisserie. You have a pointer date on the periphery of the dial and then the two openings here for the day of the week and month and a running seconds, a small seconds dial at six o'clock as well. And here's the inscription. Limited edition of 98 pieces, 25 to 35 thousands in estimated value, but I'm guessing it might go for higher than that. Those unique colors 
um, in whatever model you might find them in the Royal Oaks, whether we are talking about Yves Klein, Ferrari Red, or sometimes people call it Coral Red, um, Salmon, they always have a certain premium because they are very rare. Uh, you know, it's one thing to to go after the classic blue. It's one thing to go after silver or white dials, which are, of course, desirable in their own right. Uh, but they are, they are neither the original or nor uh, like some of these ultra rare dials that can sometimes command unreasonable premiums. Uh, this is a 15400 again, that 41 uh, millimeter case in the modern expression, you know, with the uh, matching date wheel there. And with the proportions of the tapisserie pattern, uh, very moderate, you know, not too small, not too large, which uh, is okay. I prefer it to at least the Grand Tapisserie, which uh, kind of looks like the waffle dial of my Seiko to me. I I get rubbed off the wrong way on an AP, but it is what it is. This is, as you see, a much thicker watch than, than the Jumbo, uh, but of course still quite slender uh, from what we have seen uh, with that beastly triple calendar in the Royal Oak offshore. This is lot number 20, uh, 515400OR, a 41 millimeter Royal Oak in pink gold with the classic blue dial. <clears throat> Lot 20 is expected to realize a final hammer price of 75,000 to 125,000 US dollars. We were talking about how popular these pieces are. Here's the Aquanaut travel time in pink gold and the chocolate brown dial, uh, 5164R. Uh, I, you know, one of the things that I really like about the Aquanaut as a piece of design uh, is how it's, especially in, in this latest generation, whether we are looking at the 5167 or 5164, with that rubber band sitting flush uh, on the case and between the lugs, um, and with the updated uh, design of both the Globescape dial and um, and the pattern that follows it on the rubber bands, you have a feeling that they have kind of did a somewhat flippant or flamboyant take on the integrated bracelet design, which I actually appreciate quite a bit. Um, it's still not one of my favorite watches by any means, but I prefer the Aquanaut very much so to the Nautilus. Uh, in this piece, uh, there's also a sense of balance if you prefer that. I don't necessarily mind uh, the imbalanced asymmetry, uh, which of course is always slanted towards the side where you have the crown. But in this case, uh, the crown guards and the pushers to, to jump the hour basically by one hour increments uh, kind of balance each other out on each flank of the case. And the dial is a uh, uh, chocolate brown as is usually the case with uh, the sports models in pink gold. And there you have it, 5164R, a full set. With a certificate of origin from 2016, purchased in 2016. 
from a dealer in Iowa City. This is lot 21 with an estimated value of 80 to $120,000. Number 22 is a 5712 Nautilus, the famous uh, moon phase, uh, the lineage of which in 3712 uh, A has the claim to be the first complicated Nautilus. Uh, I like it. I like that version of the story much better. Here we have... Uh, the updated version in precious metal on a leather band, uh, 5712R, asymmetric dial, micro rotor movements. It certainly has its own following within the Nautilus family. The caliber 240 is, is a marvel in its own right designed by uh, a team led by Gérard Perret, who uh, was also responsible for uh, Universal Genève's micro-rotor calibers. This is a pretty, pretty cool piece. It has an estimated value of 70 to 120,000 US dollars. Number 23, the Platinum Daytona. The 60th anniversary is upon us. So we'll see. Uh, and I think it's, it's not a coincidence that a lot of the auction houses are sourcing this watch because people are thinking about the Daytona as if they have forgot about it. Uh, don't, don't take me wrong. I think uh, Daytona is one of the hypest watches to have ever hyped. Uh, it is part of the uh, holy trinity of hype uh, between the Patek Philippe Nautilus, uh, the Rolex Daytona, and uh, Audemars Piguet Royal Oak. You have uh, basically most of the hype uh, covered, if not all of it. Uh, but since this year, 2023, is the 60th anniversary of the model, uh, it makes a lot of sense for a lot of the vendors, a lot of the auction houses in particular, to bring back this watch. This is reference 116506. Platinum with the ice blue dial that is reserved for Rolex's platinum models and the maroon outer rings on the chronograph registers, which replicates the tachometer bezel that is also in brown. Of course, it is also in ceramic. This is from that early run in 2013. Full set. Number 23 <clears throat> has an estimated value of 60 to $120,000. The 50th anniversary Rolex Daytona in platinum with the ice blue dial and the ceramic maroon bezel. Feel free again to uh, direct my attention to any of the particular lots if you want to do that with, with the Super Chat. And if you have any other watch-related questions, feel free to, again, interrupt me with a with a super chat, I will be happily getting back to you. 
Number 27 is the Pepsi on the Oyster bracelet, stainless steel with the matching bracelet, of course. This is 126710. BLRO for bleu and rouge. Uh, but you will know it by the name Pepsi, since the color combination refers to that. Uh, this is roughly from year 2021. Seems pretty clean, if not pristine in its condition. Of course, in either case, uh, you can always click the condition report here and get a general sense of it, in addition to the pictures, of course. And you can always call them. Uh, call one of the uh, specialists that are indicated here when you click at the auction details. I wouldn't necessarily call one of the presidents or, or you know, the senior vice president or the chairman, uh, but you can certainly email or call by telephone here if you want any further or any specific kind of information about the watch listed. Uh, this was not 27, 126710, BLRO, the Pepsi GMT Master 2 in stainless steel. It is expected to fetch a final hammer price between 15,000 to 25,000 US dollars. It's still one of the hottest watches in Rolex's catalog. Um, certainly the GMT Master, I think, uh, displaced the Submariner in terms of current desirability, which makes me feel more strongly about my expectation that Rolex is not going to pass over in silence uh, in the 70th anniversary of, of the Submariner, which is also the 70th anniversary of uh, Blancpain's uh, 50 Fathoms. So, you know, I don't think Rolex can afford to sit on its hands. Uh, 50, Blancpain already started releasing 50 Fathoms. I'm sure we will have a swatchy fathoms or whatever they will call it i'm sure you know the omega fandom is pretty strong so they will come up with a catchy name but i'm almost sure that there's going to be a quartz swatch watch that um that replicates the 50 fathoms i'm almost sure so Rolex has to do something with the Submariner, and I, I feel pretty strongly that it will be a Platinum Submariner um, and probably a Submariner, pure and simple. No date edition or anything like that, which will be a first, of course, for precious metal Submariners. All right, we have a pretty plain Jane watch for for auctions usually, but I like seeing these pieces, as you know. That's why I broaden my horizons usually and go beyond Sotheby's, Christie's, and Phillips. But nevertheless, even in Sotheby's, in lot 28, I think this is kind of the canary in, in the coal mine kind of uh, thing. It's it's one of the, uh, you know, simple, if you, if you ask me, uh, one of the simply beautiful also models in the current catalog. I don't like the sizing of the Explorer 2 in the current generation, but I think they're still very good-looking watches uh, and great watches built for a purpose. Uh, so if you actually like how they look and feel on your wrist, absolutely great, great watches. This is 216570. Uh, I kind of prefer the five-digit reference, 16570. But no matter. This is, of course, a fixed bezel, but still a real GMT function. 
with an arrow hand for the 24 hour indicator which uh, resonates with uh, the first generation of uh, Rolex Explorer 2's reference 1655 uh, which had similar arrow like hands that have quickly aged into this shade of orange uh, because of a certain uh, defect in the paint. Uh, of course, uh, Tudor itself in their new Black Bay Pro uh, presented their own take on that Explorer 2 heritage, on that uh, Steve McQueen heritage. Uh, that can be always an option. But hey, if this can be snapped up uh, anywhere close that, to that estimated value of four to 6000 that could be, could be an interesting deal still. But I feel like this is a watch that you can get from, from a Rolex authorized dealer at this point in time. You know, if this is a watch that, um, that you actually desire, it's possible to get. You might wait a little bit, but I think it's something that you can uh, get. And it can be a good start to start a, you know, to begin a relationship with, with a sales associate. So, you know, why not? No need to go to an auction for, for something like that. We have two Paul Newmans back to back, uh, 6239 and 6240. And you'll see the difference very quickly. 6239 has a matching tachometer bezel in stainless steel. Uh, you still have the so-called exotic Paul Newman uh, dial with those uh, Art Deco numerals in the chronograph registers, a lovely aesthetic. Uh, the Panda layout too with the black uh, subdials against the background of uh, the off-white center dial. It's a beautiful, beautiful watch. Of course, the red accents to complete uh, the visual aesthetic. The riveted oyster bracelet is uh, quite lovely and period correct as well. This is a great watch. It's a legendary watch and it has an estimated value of 80,000 to 120,000 US dollars. And we have a 6240 Paul Newman Daytona next to it. This was the reference that had an acrylic uh, bezel insert for the tachometer rather than the matching stainless steel. And even though it's from the same period, as you see, it has a slightly different aesthetic because of that. And if we were to play spot the difference, you would also notice that lot 31, which is a reference 6239, has the old school pump pushers, whereas lot, lot 32, reference 6240, has the screw down pushers. Very nice. I mean, yeah, it it seems like it is an un, in an unreal condition, honestly. Um, which looks great, but always always makes me a little uneasy. You know, what are the chances that? you will have this sort of time capsule from 
late 60s. You can never tell. And I kind of, nah. Yeah. Anyway, this is lot 32, a Paul Newman exotic dial Rolex Daytona with the reference 6240. I think, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can certainly account for, for that price difference, but, um, you know, I think the 6240 is, is one of those um, ultimate aspirations for a lot of uh, Rolex collectors, you know, the from the acrylic bezel to the exotic dial to the screw down pushers. It has a lot of, a lot of things that make um, the Daytona desirable, of course, without getting into the Paul Newman dial. This piece is expected to realize a final hammer, hammer price of 180000 to a quarter million dollars, basically. That was lot 32. Number 33 is a, a Saad uh, special, a beautiful Rolex Stay Date uh, from that uh, first reference uh, of the double quick set, right? Where you can uh, shuffle through both the day and the dates uh, from the quick setting on the crown. You also have a kind of a gradient blue dial. That's absolutely stunning. You have a diamond setting as well on that dial with baguettes at quarters and brilliant, brilliant diamonds for the rest. Uh, quite beautiful. And the watch by and large looks like it's, it's in good condition too. Not necessarily pristine, not by any means untouched, but certainly quite desirable for a watch that's almost 30 years old. It looks quite lovely. Um, this is, of course, in yellow gold, as the last digit indicates, lot 33 with the blue uh, gradient dial that is diamond set reference 18238 day date on the president bracelet with an estimated value of 18000 to 24000 US dollars We have more of a more of an odd bird or a rare bird at thirty one. This is a one six zero one, a date just in full eighteen carats yellow gold. With an onyx style, in a way. Um, with some precious stone dials, Rolex, in fact, preferred to forego any further ornamentation, a completely stripped down purist aesthetic, no luminous material, no index markers, just uh, the simple natural beauty of uh, the semi-precious stone. I think it fits wonderfully and and you know black and gold is always a winner combination uh this is 
lot 34 uh date just 1601 in 18 karat yellow gold with the onyx style roughly from the mid 70s estimated value of 30 to 40 thousand due to its rarity again we have some stunning rolex watches and 18 o 38 champagne dial 18 karat gold yellow gold also i mean uh, my mind is always blown when i uh, kind of uh, you know when the light bulb uh, goes off in my head uh, one of the first moments when i when i realized that the introduction of 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 the 1803 reference also resonated with the fact that these were watches made from 18 karat gold i was like wow that's amazing um but yeah you know the, at least rolex reference numbers make some sense um have some lineage or connection to to previous models where you can uh with the addition of numbers um and with with the changing of the very last digit uh, sometimes for uh the particular uh metal it's you know there's a method behind the madness whereas with some brands reference numbers you you can simply not follow all right well this is a 18038 uh from right around the beginning of uh, the new millennium 2001 yellow gold champagne dial diamond set with an estimated value of nine to twelve thousand dollars and at 36 we have a pretty similar example uh, of the double quick set one eight two three eight they date on the president bracelet in 18 karat yellow gold diamond set champagne dial nice little set here uh, with you know basically the ornamental side of it though no no papers apparently but hey at least you get the nice presentation box this is lot 36 with an estimated value of 12 to 18,000 US dollars. Okay. Oh, we have we have a watch that I'm very proud to own. This is, of course, right after the transition, so the nipple dial is gone, but the five-digit version of the root beer in two-tone. You have the bicolor bezel in red and yellow. Have the root beer dial that has aged really beautifully, if I can be honest about it. But nevertheless, as you can tell by the Swiss only signature here under the six o'clock um, index marker this is a service style and i'm guessing also service hands and if it is um circa 1979 as they say 
that's predictable because that should have been nipple dial. I think the nipple dial gives way to uh, the broader loom plots uh, and and the matching gold surrounds around 83, 84. So it makes sense that this would be service style and service hands. Lot 37 um, is therefore, I think, priced accordingly with 8,000 as the lower uh, end of the estimates up to 12,000 US dollars of estimated value. Guys, mo Mondays are, are strange. At least I have some people watching me today, so I'm very grateful. So please hit the like button. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can feel free to jump on if you are not too too tired. I would appreciate some, some company. But anyway, as you know, I'm always very happy to preview these auctions for you. Uh, and and talk a little bit. Next up, you have a four-digit piece from the 60s. A GMT Master 1675. with a nice chunk of loom missing from the minute hand. And they suspect the dial to have been reloomed, which is a desperate situation. And as you can see, the piece is, again, priced accordingly. Eight to twelve thousand. I would be really interested to see how those pieces will will trend. Ah, another watch that resembles what I have in the question collection, but it's about two decades later. This is a late seventies version of. 5513. It was in some of these watches where you would see those uh, spider dials, those uh, cracked lacquer dials. I don't think this particular example has seen any of that. Um, these are great pieces. I mean, uh, the four digit reference is, is just lovely, but also. The later examples have a lot that speaks for them. Um, I don't know, honestly, it really depends on the deal you get. Uh, I might suggest that you skip um, the pieces that already get the white gold surrounds, etc. when it comes to the 5513. Again, if it's going into the late 80s, Maybe it's nicer to split the difference and just go for the five digit, 14060, which is a great reference as well. Um, and again, a great distillation of the Submariner aesthetic, uh, the pure, simple balance of the dial. Uh, that's still a two liner, right? Until you come into the chronometer certification. So, you know, 5513 is great when it's late 80s, but you might as well go for 14060 or 14060M if you want something that's even closer to the contemporary, but not quite. This is lot 36, uh, 39, though, uh, uh, 5513 Submariner on the bracelet from year 1987. Uh, with an estimate of 9,000 to 12,000 US dollars.
Next up, we have a small Crown Submariner, 5508. Um, wow. I mean, it's... <laughs> I love how they call this tropical dial. You know, I mean, I love you guys. You know, Sotheby's is great. But, you know, some, some watches don't... Do they really belong in auction? I guess what brings it, what makes this one particularly desirable is the fact that it still has uh, one half of the original bracelet and a lot of the original set. Um, you know, including the box, some of the papers. I think that's, that's the uh, bezel as well. And the original crystal, too. Yeah, again, you know, the, the anniversary is coming. I guess they want to present some authentic and interesting pieces. But sometimes, perhaps, perhaps they shouldn't. This is the Small Crown 5508 Submariner at lot 40 with the tropical dial with an estimated value of 10 to $15,000. Oh, we are going to we are going to do that Bruce G. I was uh I was teasing that basically. Um I think it's going to be it's going to be same Peter and I uh we might integrate a third person, we'll see. But I started with talking about the two Cartiers that Chris Moltesanti wears in, in The Sopranos, uh, which is a, a Tank Francaise uh, and a Cartier Pasha with that diamond encrusted grille on top of it. And both pieces are in 18 karat yellow gold, of course, on matching bracelets. So, yeah, a little bit of clickbait there, Bruce G. I do apologize. Please do forgive me and still click the like button or click the dislike button. That's okay, too. Any engagement is good, as you know. Um, and I'm a glutton for punishment. So, go ahead. Number 41. But, yes, we, we are going to do a full segment probably like uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes or something, uh, talking about watches from the Sopranos, Uncle June's watch, uh, Tony Soprano's watch, uh, Meadow Soprano's watch, you know, Chris Moltisanti's watches, so on and so forth. Forty one is another sixty two thirty nine. Uh, Daytona with the acrylic bezel, but the pump pushers, the Paul Newman exotic panda dial, black registers against the white center dial, 1964. That riveted oyster bracelet. We have an estimated value of eighty thousand to one hundred and twenty thousand. We have a few interesting. Um, IWC pieces back to back, including a large wall clock. So let's uh, start with that. This is a wall clock from around 2000 uh, that is designed like a Portuguese, quite large, as you can see.
It's an electrical piece, by the way. It says automatic on the dial, but that's more of a reference to uh, the Portuguese or the Portuguese rather than uh, this wall clock itself. And at those proportions, uh, it's quite a unique piece and it's an authentic piece, but it also has the estimated value of six to nine thousand. Wow. Number 46 is a reference IW325401. It's from the Pilot Vintage Collection with the fluted bezel rotational. Uh, that this is an interesting take on the on the so-called Fortina, right? Uh, going the way of the green slash teal slash turquoise touch before that particular shade of the color was cool. This is from 24, 2010. Um, interesting piece with an exhibition caliber on the back, hand wound. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I can't, I can't get too excited about this particular aspect of IWC's heritage. So I'm not going to say uh, much about it. Uh, good for them. 44 millimeters in diameter. Lot 46 with an estimated value of two to 4,000 for this pilot vintage collection watch in stainless steel. We have, uh, I kind of like these, uh, these particular engineers. This is uh, titanium. Um, they were also served on a matching bracelet too, but there are a lot of examples uh, that have this sort of leather bands. I think also there were rubber bands for them too. In titanium, there was the option of the full titanium bracelets. In this case, you have um, a leather strap with contrast stitching, which is a nice aesthetic for the watch. These are absolute steals on the secondary market, by the way. Uh, you can just search for them as uh, uh, Ingenieur Mercedes or Ingenieur AMG, something of that sort, and you will come up. Uh, or you can just type in Ingenieur on any of the engine, let's say if you are in Chrono 24, uh, and look for titanium cases, and it, you'll probably chance upon a version of this. Uh, the estimate is pretty realistic, but I'm sure you can get it right around that price anyways on the secondary market, and perhaps with a matching titanium bracelet as well, which is kind of cool. And this, um, again, this is quite modern, so it's, it's not as big as the big engineer, but it's also not uh, as traditionally proportioned as the uh, original Jarajanta design that was the Jumbo. So, but still, an interesting watch and the fact that it's a titanium piece and otherwise a pretty stripped down piece that um, can easily remind you of the dashboard of of a nice car which was the vibe they're going for that makes it a very cool watch uh, very underrated uh, engineer a mercedes amg edition with an estimated value of two to four thousand dollars this is a titanium self-winding piece with an engraved case back that's uh commemorates that registers that collaboration the iwc big pilot with that large onion crown uh, 
seven day power reserve, which is indicated at three o'clock there, a centrally deployed second sand and a date window at six o'clock. It comes actually on a in a presentation box, which is no longer the case, of course, with IWC watches, since they are saving the environment. Uh, this is from roughly year two thousand and three. Lot forty four is a stainless steel big pilot's watch. 46 millimeters, so uh, going in the tradition of the Beua, so to speak. Uh, reference IW5002. This has an estimated value of six to nine thousand dollars. Hey, thank you, Gandog. I have I have about another hour to go, so if you if you want to squeeze in a question or two, preferably with a with a super chat, uh, which if you happen to be the last one of the day, will get you into the raffle as well. So by all means, but nice to have you in the audience in either case. Okay, this is pretty cool. We have a Cartier piece with a Gearshay decorated dial. I mean, it shows its age, but a nice platinum open faced pocket watch from 1930s. It's it's pretty pretty cool relic if nothing else i wish they had better photos but anyway this is okay so jlc movement i'm glad they they write that um a lot of the movements signed as european watch and clock co that were done for Cartier are actually produced by uh, Gégé Le Coutre. So this is just a watch like that, a platinum sapphire set pocket watch from 1930 by Cartier uh, with blued breguet hands and a Gearshay decorated dial with Arabic numerals. 46 millimeter, so quite a traditional pocket watch size for 48. We have a Rolex pocket watch. I love this particular shape. Uh, it's like a barrel and it's just fantastic. Uh, in white gold, it must be also quite hefty. Uh, it's chronometer certified with the uh, uh, main dial, actually diamond set at the quarters with baguettes and uh, brilliant diamonds for the rest of the eight. And then you have also uh, running seconds uh, down below. You have the fob, you have the presentation box. It's It's all quite cool open faced piece in white gold 41 with 37 uh, the fob itself is by the way in matching white gold and signed rolex as well i mean i should say chain uh because fob literally refers to what is attached to the chain. So excuse my casual phrasing there. But yes, so white gold watch with matching chain with a clip attached to the end of it as well. Post-war white gold Rolex 
pocket watch. With an estimated value of seven to twelve thousand dollars. At lot fifty nine, we have a very nice Piaget perpetual calendar from late eighties. This is reference one five nine five eight. Gouverneur, yellow gold automatic piece that has that sleek uh, design of Piaget. The case is rather pristine. The piece almost looks unworn. And I kind of love this notion of a uh, you know silvered white dial with gray sub dials the moon phase has that beautiful sky blue in the background it's a very balanced and traditional design for for a perpetual calendar um, listen i mean it's it's going to be a little small for a lot of people's modern tastes uh, since it's 33 millimeters. Um, and for a perpetual calendar, you might say, how are you going to read and understand anything? You'll probably be right. But it's a lovely looking dress watch, honestly, uh, by Piaget, uh, number 59, with an estimated value of four to $6,000. Oh, sorry, I passed everything a little too quickly there. We have two nice color travers, reference 96. And... 96 is is quite uh, foundational in so many ways because uh, it's understood as the first uh, and designed by uh, the famous uh, Ari uh, Stern after uh, the Stern takeover of the company. Uh, this is a platinum piece with a diamond set dial, small seconds, Dauphine hands that were once loomed. Of course, once again, you're talking about a watch that's positively minuscule in 31 millimeter, but a great representation of a bygone time of beautiful simplicity in white metal with a diamond set dial. At lot 61, we have a reference 96 Calatrava by Patek Philippe. Estimated value of 65, uh, sorry, 15 to $20,000. We have a lovely pink on pink reference 96 Calatrava at lot 62. Again, look at those beautifully drooping lugs from the profile. Such a beautiful and sleek watch. Pink gold case, uh, that sort of salmon pink dial. Again, the dauphin hands and small seconds at six o'clock. The oxidization is, is pretty noticeable, but I think it, it makes the watch look uh, a certain way that, I don't know, at least appeals to me. This is lot 62. Again, um, a 
Calatrava from the 40s, which means it's small. And this is an estimated value of seven to ten thousand dollars. Pink on pink reference ninety six Calatrava. Number sixty six is again a genre of of a Patek Philippe watch that's gaining in recognizability, if not necessarily uh, in prominence. Uh, this is a round piece with an integrated bracelet um, that has this sort of uh, maybe snake skin kind of texture, uh, white gold with the matching bracelet. Again, very sleek, uh, very slender from the profile. A very 60s piece with that uh, particular shade of ink blue dial, white Roman numerals, maybe like uh, silver even, you know, maybe not perfectly white, but they certainly go well with the white gold case and bracelets. It's a lovely piece again at 33 millimeters. It may or may not be up your alley. Uh, but I think the integrated bracelet is is a cool look. Um, the problem with these pieces are usually with the size of the bracelet. In this case, uh, the circumference is supposedly 195 millimeters, which is not bad. Um, but there's also a certain kind of a YOLO effect, right? You know, that because these are arranged by cutting. Um, and once you cut them, it's not a very straightforward process to really expand them and make them larger. It's not impossible, uh, but it's certainly not preferable. So that's why for quite some time the collectors were not really hot on these pieces. But increasingly they are becoming... A little more desirable so we'll see where where it exactly goes but anyway this is a fascinating diamond set piece i mean i don't even know how many carats of diamonds you see here white gold uh, traditionnel 81760 slash O O O G dash ninety eight sixty two. This is a <clears throat> incredible work of gem setting by Vacheron Constantin. Absolutely untouched, as you can see, uh, from when it was bought at the princely sum of three hundred twenty one thousand in pounds sterling. So the person who gets it in the auction probably is um, getting quite a sweet deal. No box, no papers, however. And mm, the sexy lot number 69 has an estimated value of 100,000 to 200,000 US dollars. We have a few very cool Cartiers back to back. Um, I really like the Bagnoir and, and the Santos uh, along these two, but I will still go through most of them. This is the tonneau shaped. Uh, Cartier reference 2435, uh, those uh, traditional exploded Roman numerals, the blued Breguet hands, and also the uh, Guilloche uh, pattern, the Cartier Paris writing and se secret signature at 7 o'clock. It 
it's in platinum and has that perfect curvature sapphire cabochon from the private collection this could be could be an interesting opportunity for someone to pick up this watch if they're interested in the shape i kind of find it a little too dramatic in its in its tapering honestly right you know you have this uh rather chubby case in the middle that um really cuts to the lugs quite dramatically and and the strap for my taste ends up being too thin so i i don't like the tonneau for that reason this particular take on the tonneau but uh, that's just me Number 70 from private collection, uh, platinum tonneau reference 2435F with an estimated value of eight to 12,000 US dollars. And next up we have uh, Banuar Allongé, uh, which is literally what it, what it says. Uh, it's it's uh, Cartier's bathtub looking watch that is stretched out um, you can see it has a very interesting lug structure as well this one is in pink gold again with those uh, stretched out roman numerals uh, the guilloche decoration of the dial heat blued hands combined with the sapphire cabochon express that uh, elegant Cartier aesthetic from year 2005. This pink gold Banuar Allongé is uh, priced at ten to $15,000. And uh, Cartier Santos uh, from... 1985, roughly speaking. Roman numerals and inside them a perfectly square railroad track in yellow gold from Cartier Paris. It's 25 by 39 and the dial is not in the perfect condition, honestly. So the estimated value of the watch reflects that a little bit. I'm still not sure if I would go for something like that, even if uh, the model is otherwise desirable for you. But it's a decent example of uh, Cartier Paris from mid 80s uh, in the Santos design that would be positively diminutive by today's standards, so beware. But lot 73 has an estimated value of six to 9,000 in US dollars. Uh, we are continuing our preview of the March 7 auction of Sotheby's in New York. If you have any other watch questions, please don't hesitate to send them into the chat. And if you want to direct my uh, attention to any particular lots, uh, please feel free. If I catch the chats, I still try to respond. Um, but a super chat always gets my attention. At the end of the day, also, we have that further incentive that you can read in the ticker. Um, the first and last super chats of every live stream in the month of February gets entered to the giveaway, to the raffle of which the prize is uh, Seiko 5 Rowing Blazers watch with the lime green dial. We have a beautiful rectangular um, extra thin white gold Vachon Constantin piece in this reference 6791. Again, I think it's a gorgeous piece. Um, I'm sure it can be, look, I mean, it's uh, 
at the right price, these kinds of pieces are actually quite elegant. And, and knowing Vacheron Constantin, I almost know that uh, they would service something like this and probably can, you know, can help you preserve that dial and uh, make a new dial to it, I'm sure. For it, I should say. Um, but yeah, it, it would be a project in a way. I mean, you have seen how how the dial looks uh, from oxidization, certainly, but possibly also uh, some humidity ingress and possibly even water damage. But what a beautiful looking watch otherwise. Um, this is 2275 by 30. To again, a very small and dainty watch, uh, very thin watch as well, but in many ways that makes it a perfect dress watch. This is number 75, three to five thousand US dollars in estimated value. Uh, Patrick Philippe Gondolo with. Uh, centrally deployed seconds hand and a date window at three o'clock. Otherwise, we have uh, the aesthetic that is completed with uh, Breguet hands and Breguet numerals. It has that uh, tonneau shaped case, of course, in white gold. Again, a very sleek and beautiful dress watch. Comes uh, with a nice box, a pouch, and outer box as well. It's not that old, by the way. It does have have a very, you know, vintage-like aesthetic. But I think you can already tell by the font of the, um, <laughs> by the font of of that date that just looks jarring on the style but anyway um this is 2008 patek philippe gondolo 5030g at lot 76 it has seven to twelve thousand dollars of estimated value we have a traditional color travel here with the hobnail bezel enamel dial with Roman numerals. Uh, it is also marked there in my right. Small seconds, heat blued hands in pink gold. This is a 5115R, relatively well preserved. A hand wound piece with again with the hobnail bezel enamel dial and in rose gold in 35 millimeters six to eight thousand US dollars of estimated value <clears throat> There we go. As you as you see, the travel time does not exclusively belong actually to Patek's uh, sportier watches. It was actually very uh, ably, and in fact, for the first time, presented in a Calatrava case. Uh, this is, of course, a much later uh, edition. Uh, the first. Uh, reference of the Patek Philippe uh, travel time, color Trava was uh, twenty five ninety seven. Of course, this is a much later reference, fifty one thirty four R with the Breguet numerals and the extra hour hand, and a twenty four hour indicator at twelve o'clock, a running seconds. Uh, 
a small seconds dial at six o'clock as well. Thirty-seven millimeters in diameter is the case size. Lot seventy-eight has an estimated value of twelve to eighteen thousand dollars. Wow, we have uh, we have the original star wheel in a way. Uh, in the millinery case. This is the 25898 in rose gold for the 125th anniversary around the turn of the millennium. You can uh, see the wandering hours complication thanks to those transparent uh, discs and also uh, the stars that give uh, Audemars Piguet's wristwatch iteration of the movement in which uh, they were a pioneer, its name. A very wonderfully balanced and nicely designed watch, if you ask me. Uh, these used to be much cheaper, by the way. I don't know how the new release uh, of the Star Wheel complication uh, in the Code 1159 line will affect it. It will probably pull those prices up. Um, but this estimated value seems out of all proportion. Nevertheless, I'm sure some who have tried getting the Code 1159 star wheel with to no avail uh, will probably look into opportunities like this. So Lot 79, which is a limited edition millinery star wheel in pink gold reference 25898, has an estimated value here. Uh, in the Sotheby's New York auction of March 7, 40 to 60,000 US dollars. Next up, we have um, Jeje Le Coutre uh, Reverso GMT in pink gold. And this is the Grand GMT, so it has the uh, day night uh, at two o'clock on the main dial, which, which is silvered and guilloche decorated. And you also have uh, the uh, flip side, which has the power reserve indicator on a black dial uh, that has a little bit of a more sporty uh, aesthetic, so to speak, with the uh, broad sword hands uh, with loom and also a 24-hour day and night indicator as well as, as the GMT indicator as well, the two pushers, of course, uh, operate those options. And this is the box set. Number 80 has an estimated value of, of 10 to 15,000 in US dollars. And at lot 81, you have the Reverso Dan Knight in stainless steel. This time, you simply have a pusher or a, really a corrector there, which you have to manipulate with the pin. But in either case, you have the classic Reverso dial 
And on the flip side, you have, again, a black dial that's still Gearshare decorated, but has a little more of a sporty aesthetic with the night and day 24 hour indicator at six o'clock. And this piece is presented naked without box and papers. The famous two-faced watch, the reverse of day and night. In this case, two watches in one from around the turn of the millennium. Lot 81 has an estimated value of four to eight thousand US dollars. Eighty seven is a uh, Ming seventeen oh six copper with that salmon dial in stainless steel. Hundred meters of water resistance. This is a piece at 38 millimeters that can be worn on a variety of different wrists. Number 87 with an estimate of two to four thousand dollars. The piece is also offered at no reserve. So it's exactly the kind of uh, watch that. Uh, they're expecting for people to be lured in by the fact there's no reserve and by the fact that the estimate is kept low. But I think it might sell for a little bit more than that. Pardon me, considering how Ming watches have trended recently. Um, again, a similar piece in a sense from uh, another micro-independent Lot 88, uh, this is an Ordain reference model one, blue flume. It's kind of vitreous enamel dials that uh, they are known for. Again, a 38 millimeters stainless steel piece with a south winding caliber and full set once again the estimated value is two to four thousand US dollars we have two interesting takes on the Royal Oak back to back um, This is quartz in 33 millimeters, two-tone with that uh, Petit Tapisserie diamond set dial with the AP logo at 12 o'clock. Uh, quartz movement, 33 millimeters, as I mentioned. This is reference 56303 with an estimate of eight to $12,000. Lot 90. is another quartz piece. Uh, this is, again, 33 millimeters, reference 56175, in what was, at the time, quite a unique execution of the two-tone by AP, where uh, the case and uh, the bracelet was in tantalum, but the crown octagonal bezel as well as the tapering interlinks were in pink gold. Um, and I think uh, with that uh, grain brushed dial, uh, there was a great uh, cohesion to the aesthetics of the watch that were 
as I said, quite unique in the time. This is mid 80s, right? You know, well before uh, FB Jean's Chronometre Bleu. Uh, this 33 millimeter Royal Oak with a quartz movement has an estimated value of nine to 12,000 US dollars at lot number 90. A lot of very interesting um, minuscule and and jewelry uh, oriented watches by Piaget, by Cartier, by Gégé Le Coutre, even Otmar Piguet. I'm gonna, unless there are any special requests, I'm gonna pass uh, over in silence over many many of them. Um, and maybe walk all the way here to a feminine version of the Pasha at 32 millimeters in diameter with a jam set dial with those uh, hugely oversized Arabic numbers for the quarters and this kind of uh, baby blue Aesthetic to the watch. Uh, this is white gold on a leather strap that resonates with that baby blue theme. It's also on a quartz movement. We have an older version of the Prege Marine um, in, I think, 26 millimeters. It's a very, uh, it's a ladies' version, beautiful guilloche work, uh, Prege hands, and a centrally deployed second hand, exquisitely heat blued, and a six, uh, and a uh, date window at six o'clock as well. This is a nice piece, nice self-winding piece in yellow gold with matching uh, clasp there, but it's pretty, uh, pretty small. So I think this could look uh, very nice on a, on a woman's wrist, but I think at that um, it's a little at that size, it's a little small. Meech, I heard you're talking about um, <clears throat> what lady up? size uh watches, and I had to uh, I had to uh, join the panel, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> being the designated size queen of the community. You, 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 you gotta have your say, you, you got Correct. you gotta gotta you gotta you gotta tell. Us. I, gotta be frank and honest with you yeah <laughs> so what about what about lady size you just want to say lady size can Absolutely. we hear it once more lady size <laughs> oh man how you been man how you been today i gotta admit I, you know what lord lord i gotta be frank and honest with you lord can i be I mean, frank and honest with you yes sir. i'm i'm all I'm a little buzzed right now. We actually, um, it's a little ironic, I guess, but um, uh -huh. we celebrated uh, one of our buddies. He's, uh, he's a month sober now, actually. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, that's why he I celebrated his, his one month of sobriety by drinking. Please explain. Yeah, that's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of makes it funny. Um, but hey, good on him, actually. Good on him. He's, uh, he's a good kid. A good kid. I don't. I don't doubt that. So, you guys celebrated on his behalf by drinking. So, and in, he enjoyed what vicariously while you were drinking, or was he not? Uh, look, I'm not. I'm not going to get into. Um, I'm not. I'm not going to get okay. into its poisons here. But um, put it this way: his addiction ain't drinking. Put it that way. So he's what? His addiction isn't drinking. So, 
Um, okay. He, he's he's in he's in for something else here. I don't judge. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> well, that's uh, that was a lot more cryptic than than anything you could have said, but we'll leave it Look, at that. All, all that matters is he's getting he's on the road to recovery. That's that's all that matters. And we had a few drinks over it. Um it's been something in the works for quite a few years for him. So I'm happy for him. Really, I am. Good. In, in more ways than one. So, anyways. Very good. So, the the weather is a little better, at least good enough where you can go out and, and drink. Oh, it's always, it's, it's always good enough to drink, my guy. It's always good enough to drink. But, um, actually, you know, Jokes aside, yeah, it, it hit 45 degrees here. So, uh, yeah, a lot of people. Um, even the ladies were starting to bring out the short shorts, uh, Lord. When, when I was going to say, this must, be, this must be short shorts weather. You you got it. Yeah. You got it. Absolutely. You read my mind. Absolutely. And then, of course, tomorrow, or, or rather today, I should say, is Valentine's Day. Lord, do you have any Valentine's Day plans? Not at all. Not at all, actually. Um, I'm I'm perfectly single, um, and not not even ready to mingle. Actually, I'm just keeping to myself, you know. Um, so you're you just gonna have that box of tissues on hand uh, this Valentine's Day. <laughs> yes, and a pint of <laughs> and a pint of ice cream. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I thought you were about to say a pint of lotion, but okay. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, you meant I, I thought you, you were gonna say I'm gonna cry and you know <laughs> watch my favorite rom coms and, and eat a pint of ice cream. Something like that. I would be you know, joke aside, I'd be very interested to see that data, like how much it actually um it spikes on Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh what exactly? Uh wa watching porn or eating ice cream? Well, both actually, but you know, I, I more or less porn. I'd actually be more interested in that, uh, seeing the data on that. <laughs> I, I know you're quite the gentleman and the scholar when it when it comes to that. So, uh, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I'm a connoisseur of sorts. Uh, you know, so that must be researched. You know, um, I, I'm still sitting on that hundred dollar gift card that my Omega rep gave me. And I'm thinking about buying yeah. another G-Shock. Ooh, okay. That's that's not my wheelhouse at all. I wish um, at least Oz was was on the panel. But tell me more. I, I, I'm just looking here. I mean, I've already got a Casio. I, I, that's what I'd buy again because it's easy. Mm -hmm. It's easy to flip out of, honestly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I see a few of them here on Amazon. They're like ninety-three bucks, mm -hmm. seventy bucks, eighty bucks. I mean, yeah, it's tempting. Tempting. I mean, there's not a whole lot that you can buy for a hundred dollars when it comes to watches. That's you know, beloved, and considered to be great quality. No, not really. Not really. You're right. Um. Thomas is saying, I personally get an older generation Pasha. They offer incredible value pre-owned. Yes, actually. I love the, uh, what was it, 20, I want to say 2324. I think it's the 2324. Um, it's, it's kind of like reduced size. I think it's maybe 34 millimeters. Not much larger than that. Why do you uh, want to buy a Pasha? I'm just curious. It's great. Uh, act sorry, it, it's actually 35 plus. And not necessarily. I mean, it's uh, it's just a poll. Uh, you know, don't don't get too excited all of a sudden. But I do like I do like the Pasha. Um, I don't know. I had that little uh, wrist roll earlier on the channel shorts. I thought it looked good. Maybe maybe I was uh, fooling yeah. myself, but you don't want to buy Cartier, though, Lord. I mean, you don't want to buy them. The, the movements are made in the movements are made in China, China. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I I think it's a it's a cool piece. I kind of 
they, they're also the big date versions, you know, where you have the big dates at, at six o'clock. I even like those a little better. These are kind of cool too. You know, on the full bracelet, you can, of course, always wear it on a leather strap. Yeah. I do like the dial. I'll admit, I do like the dial. Yeah, I think it has that, you know, guilloche aesthetic. And I I kind of like the Arabics, you know, the, the font, the fact that it's only at the quarters, you know, it's it's an interesting, interesting design, you know, and it, it does when you put two and two together, especially when you see them with the uh, with the grill as you have in uh chris's uh chris Maltesanti's, um you know i always get watch. a kick out of that um when chris comes back to adriana and says all oh, he was jumped and mugged and adriana just butchers the, the word cartier like oh they even took your cartier <laughs> christopher uh, yeah that's that's it Yeah, and, and this uh, melancholy writer's block look uh, with the uh, tank uh, Francaise as well. Yeah, he, he loved this Cartier, Chris. I forgot, actually. I think I think he got his tank stolen, right? Like, because Adriana gave him the Cartier tank as a gift, and I think that's the one he got stolen. I think so. You know, as much as I love geeking out about The Sopranos, I don't always remember every single detail. But I do remember that scene that his that one of her first reactions was like, you know, even your Cartier. But yeah. it still surprised me that Oz has not has not seen it. And they, uh, I, I know Oz likes to kind of, um, I don't know, maybe throw his weight around. He's the he's the. Uh, an avid um, film watcher and he hasn't watched The Sopranos, but hey, I can't say a whole lot because I have still yet to watch The Godfather yet, so you know, mm -hmm. it is what it is. Yeah, but uh, you know, I mean, when it comes to the movies you haven't watched, nothing surprises me at this point because like, you know, some of the it's it's like part of the school curriculum, some of the stuff that you didn't watch, like you haven't watched Scarface. You haven't watched The Godfather. Um, you haven't watched Rocky or Rambo, I think, either or. I've watched bits and pieces of Rambo. I'd have to sit down and rewatch it again. Mm -hmm. Rocky never got into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> I, you know what? I actually, um, funny enough, though, um, one movie that I was forced to see like this this was like in high school i think this is my senior year um was schindler's list and i'm actually glad i actually uh got forced to watch that one because it's actually pretty decent forced <laughs> yeah and no i i was because like the um i took a course i forget what their actual course was called i think mm -hmm. it was actually film study but it, it wasn't like um you wouldn't watch stupid films um like like how do i say this like you wouldn't watch like a show like dumb and dumber like you would actually have to watch a legitimate film and you'd have to write an essay on it of like what you've learned instead um, of a, instead of a cult classic like Dumb and Dumber. You want to say? I mean, well, qu quite frankly, yeah, I, I, between you and the fans, but I think those are historical documents. But um, you know, uh, honestly, you know, that's that's why I think the sequels have hurt me a little. Like when it comes to coming to America and and Dumb and Dumb and Dumber, because the first ones were just so good. That they should have left it alone. I think that's uh, the case with a lot of movies. You can argue that case with a lot of movies, honestly. Uh, for sure, but for them to come back to it decades later, that's what yeah. I Yeah. But yes, so you were talking about your experience of taking this course and and it, I mean you had to watch like Shindex serious list. films. Yeah, you had to you had to essentially, yeah. So it was I I think there was only like it was a really small course actually or a really small class I should say. So like the average she took in was probably about eight kids per per the semester. Um but yeah, I, I forget what I forgot everything we watched, honestly. I think we watched Schindler's List. Uh, you know the rotating class had had to watch uh The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. 
And I think mm-hmm. the second movie we had to watch was uh, um, Rolling Thunder, Hear My Cry. And you had to write like a, a legitimate like three page essay on what you've learned in like okay. an entire. Uh, yeah, it was basically uh, basically what you learned. And anyways, beside the point. Yeah, I'm glad I actually watched that film. I, I still watch it from time to time. Nice. All right. That's that's cool. I mean, I I, I wouldn't expect uh, Meech's, you know, one of Meech's favorite movies to be Schindler's well, I didn't say it was my favorite, kind but, of, you know. Kind of <laughs> I just, yeah. I just, it had, you know, with Liam Neeson, I think he did a very good job, I mean, in that film. I think he did. And then um, the actor who played, uh, uh, I can't, the name slips my mind right now. But basically, the antagonist, uh, Nazi, I think he did a very good job as well. Um, uh, yeah, I think the it, movie was well it, done. Uh, Raf, Raf Fiennes? I, think, I, 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 I can't remember. Um, wait, wait, are you talking about the, the name of the, the, the movie character who he played or the character itself? I mean, the actor himself, excuse me. <laughs> that is the actor. That's the ex- ac- actor's name. Yeah, I don't probably. remember his character name, honestly. I know, right. you know, he, he's big in the Harry Potter films. I know, like, all the Harry Potter geeks would immediately blurt out. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, exactly. He's, uh, what is that, Vol- Voldemort or something? In yeah. Harry Potter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that and there's, thing. like, a, there's another series I've never I've never watched from, from start to finish. I've never done it, but I'm more mm-hmm. of a Lord of the Rings guy, to be fair, so. <laughs> oh, me too, by far, by far. I mean, when it comes to the books, especially. Um, the movies, you know, I, I like them, but I don't feel so strongly about them that I feel, you know, I need to protect it against, uh, you know, uh, the the lesser movie, Harry Potter or something. I, Harry, Harry Potter movies are fine. The books were, I, yeah. the books were, I mean, I, it, it made me, it made me want to cut myself, honestly. I mean, they were, they were not <laughs> well written at all, but, you know, it's kind of a shame that an entire generation has as their cultural sphere, you know, Harry Potter and Game of Thrones and nothing else. So that's that's kind of disappointing. But I've heard the Jurassic Park books are supposed to be pretty fucking um pretty heavy, actually. I've heard they're supposed to be pretty vile. Um and like the actual Jurassic Park movies really had to dial shit back down because they're mm. If you were to actually make a legitimate Jurassic Park movie, I guess it's more of a horror flick than it is like an action flick. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you might say that. Honestly, I've, I haven't, I haven't actually. I read that book once, and not in English, as it turns out. So, uh, I, I don't. I have a very vague memory of it, so I can't tell you really. But I was just talking. Um, Wait, who was I talking to about about American? Ah, Saint Peter. I was talking to him about American Psycho and uh, how the movie has uh, a few different things compared to the book, uh, which, by the way, is much more vile as well. If you can imagine, have you right. watched American Psycho as well? I've watched. I, I had to. Uh, so basically, our college professor uh, made oh us watch God. it. Watch okay. it because you, you he was watch. hungover. And I've watched half of it, cause like uh, our, oh our class God. ended. So, but you you do remember the scene, for example, uh, "Don't touch the watch," right? Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. Okay. I've, I've seen that. Yep. So in in the book, for example, this was um, "Don't touch the Rolex," uh, but the rumor is that Rolex positively and absolutely didn't want to be involved in or associated with this movie. Uh, since it was supposed to be part of the, you know, uh, serial killer's wardrobe, the two-tone Rolex. So they they decided to just render it as don't touch the watch and also use a prop watch rather than an authentic Rolex for... Quite a few brands actually pulled out of that film. Because I, I remember watching the, uh, I don't know, behind the scenes uh Cliff notes about it, and like there's supposed to be mm-hmm. some pretty big names, like Air Mazda's supposed to be in, like, um, 
supposed to be name dropped in that and uh Balenciaga oh, yeah. or not Balenciaga. There's like just quite a few fashion brands that immediately just said no, we want no no part of this. And they had to like legitimately they, you change know, the, it as they filmed. In the book, uh I mean it should come as no surprise really because of the author, but every single outfit is described almost as a laundry list or even the houses too, a laundry list of name brands, right? So right. the book has pages and pages and pages of name dropping in total. Uh, and only, you know, a, you know, smattering of that makes it to the movie and not usually in the, in the way of, you know, huge brand names, honestly. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it's 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 nice. Patrick Bateman is an interesting character. You know, we we had what what was the name of that guy? He has kind of disappeared. We had a finance bro as the as a part of the community for a little bit, who was uh, tuning in from East Asia. Do you remember this guy? I forget. Kane Toad? No, I'm just joking. No, <laughs> no, he went literally. Uh, he went to talk to a man about a dog and, and never came back. Uh, ain't that, that ain't that something, I guess. Um, I guess but I don't know. I, I bounce I, around I learned, too many streams. I, I learned that's an expression that Australians use, you know, that when when you want to just uh, make a quick exit from, from somewhere without oh. having to explain, you know, I've, I got to go and talk to a man about a dog and... Kind of like the Patrick Bateman line, you know. I I gotta return some re- videotapes. Oh yeah, I've got I've got a lunch meeting with Cliff Huxtable at the Four Seasons. <laughs> uh... Yeah, yeah. So Mike David is saying, "What have I walked on?" I I wish I knew, Mike David. I I'm not even sure how the timing was and what we are, we were talking about but it's always great fun with with me so i would never um sacrifice that spontaneity and conversation what are you wearing today Meech? uh I, I actually pulled the uh the milgauss from the safe actually um so i needed to get that out uh because my my uh one of my reps asked me, he's like, oh, you still have the Milgauss? I'm like, yeah, I just got in the bank safe. So <laughs> I don't know if they uh, attempted to call my bluff or what, but um, I figured I'd, I'd pull it out. So, Do you think they were trying to check in on you? I feel like they are. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's all in a jest. Um, I think they know that I don't, I don't flip Rolexes. They know I flip watches, but they know I don't flip Rolexes. So it is what it is. By the way, guys, it's the last 10 minutes, more or less. As you know, the first and last Super Chat of the day gets entered into the raffle for the giveaway. Uh, the prize is a Seiko 5 Rowing Blazers watch with the lime green dial that I have actually, as it happens, right here. Um, let me take it out in the meantime. So if you squeeze in one last Super Chat, whether you are sh- just showing your support or asking a specific question, um, you'll get entered. The numbers are posted and constantly updated on the community page. So you can always check the situation there. And there we go. This is what we have. Uh. Hard. It's like I'm looking. <laughs> it's like I'm looking in the mirror. <laughs> yeah. So that's the price for February. Uh, the January one was the uh, orange green dial version, and that's already with its new owner, with its winner. So keep that in mind while Meech is tinkling. Oh, no. It it would sound a lot louder than that, honestly. (laughs) Good for you, Meech. Nice, uh, nice, healthy urinary jet. Uh, It's it's a sign of vigor in your old age, especially. Correct. You know, no kidney stones here. Not yet, anyways. 
So your your experience with Cartier recently has really cooled you off from the brand, I see, huh? Yeah, I just I really hesitate to buy another one, honestly. It's like I like I was telling I don't know who I told this to, honestly. But I said it's one thing if I if it was like a pre owned watch from like twenty fifteen or whatever and then the movement malfunctioned. Fine, I get it, whatever, shit happens, but to buy one brand new and to see the watch not make it a year, that really kind of pisses me off, honestly. I think that would piss most people off, to be frank with you. So yeah. I like the design. And yes, I do I do kind of toy with the idea of buying Cartier again. But at the same time, I always remember the watch never made it a year. So what the fuck's the point? Yeah, that is a little despairing, honestly. Um beyond their particular approach to service and servicing the movements in particular, I think the fact that it failed you so quickly, it's, it's something's off. I think what, to add the, uh, to add insult to injury, I guess, I think what, what definitely makes the, the nail in the coffin for Cartier is, I primarily wore that watch for dress, like an official dress watch, much like the JLC. So it really never saw hard use. And that's what kind of really kind of cements mm. the case here. It it never seen a whole lot of wear. It never got worn rough like the Submariner or the Milgauss or whatever. Um, so to see the watch malfunction on very mm. light use, it definitely, yeah, definitely just kind of, Add to the pile. Yeah, that that's that's very strange. That's absolutely strange. Yeah, for for everything that that can go into recommending uh, the new generation of the Santos, which is, you know it's it's a cool design. It's uh, it has that easy exchange strap system, which makes it very practical. Um, it's it's also again you know you used it as as exclusively a dress watch, and it's not look I mean it's not a sports watch in the way we understand it, but uh, it also has that sporty vibe, so it can actually be worn in you know kind of di diverse occasions, and certainly not right. only when you're suited and booted. So it's um. That, that is disappointing that it would not survive in your experience the first year of rather light wear. I blame China. <laughs> well, I thought that was Omega. Well, I mean, tomato, tomato. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, I, I do want to go on the record and say, yes, Cartier is more than willing to... Um, eat the bullet of their mistake. The only thing that really kind of ticked me off, and I don't believe this is Cartier on Cartier um, solely. I think if I would have brought this up to Cartier directly, I think they would have um, been more than happy to pay for shipping and handling. Um, but when I talked right. to my original boutique, they wanted me to pay for shipping and handling, which I think is a little bullshit, to be frank with you. But hey, it, it, you know, whatever, I guess. For, for a watch under warranty, they wanted Correct. you. Yeah. They wanted to pay you for shipping for what? So I was going to ship it back to my dealer, and I was going to have them. Then the dealer would ship it back to Cartier, essentially. Um, look, I, I know we're kind of splitting hairs here between pennies and dollars, I guess, because I think shipping it, me shipping it in the same state would probably be less than ten bucks if I really wanted to go the cheap route. Now, if I did it overnight, it probably cost me a fifty bucks at the heaviest. I don't even think it would cost me that much, but you know, and some people would argue, oh, 50 bucks on a $7,000 watch or six and a half thousand dollar watch is nothing, but it's the principle on my point, in my viewpoint. Yeah. Um, I think you should put the bill both ways, you know, me shipping it to you and then shipping it back. Um, but Hey, you know, it is what it is. I'm just saying if I would have called Cartier service center, mm. although they were a bitch to get a hold of, I think they would have, I think, 
they would have been more than accommodating of them saying, oh, yeah, we'll pay for the shipping. Or at least they would have paid the shipping uh, for me to have them, for me to have to ship it to them. Maybe they went to pay right. the shipping back. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Well, you know, with with the whole idea of, uh, I don't know, honestly, with the idea of, of uh, warranty, I, I would expect them, especially, you know, again, considering the fact that this failed you the, the first year of use, they should they should have been at least a little nicer about it. Oh, look, I mean, they were more than willing to fix their mistake. I, you know, it's just me yeah. being a prick that I typically am. I don't like my movement to be fucked with or replaced by a refurbished yeah. movement. Um, look, I mean, I'll, I'll say this. Cartier was more than willing to fix their mistake. You know, and I think that's mm -hmm. kind of the bigger point there. I mean, I wouldn't read too much into what I say because I'm a little bit more finicky with my shit. Um but look, I mean, as far as, you know, as far as generally speaking, yeah, Carty was more than willing to kind of uh, cover the ends here. And I think that's the bigger picture. Yeah, well, respect then in, in that case. I mean, you know, sorry that your particular experience wasn't so great. Um, I've, you know, I've not owned any Cartier watches actually so far. So I wouldn't recommend them. So. <laughs> I just, huh? you know, I, I wouldn't recommend them, honestly. Yeah, Funny enough, though, I did get a phone call and they told me, I, I, I saw mm -hmm. I was on the wait list for a solid rose gold Cartier medium Santos. And I just got a phone call like a month or so ago asking me if I was still interested. And I said, nah, not really anymore. And she said, oh, okay. Well, we're just kind of, um, you know, we're touching base with everybody because we're, you know, we're seeing that we had your name down. I'm like, yeah, you can take my name off. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a cool one. A Tudor Submariner at lot 146, reference 79090, with an estimated value of five to eight thousand dollars. If these would go back to like four and a half at the heaviest, I'd probably buy one. You mean like the older Tudor subs? Oh, for sure. Like I, I remember when they used to be like four and a half, and everyone thought they were complete oh, yeah. dog shit. And don't get me wrong, they kind of are, but at the same time, they're charming. Um, but nowadays, you can't touch them for less than seven. Yeah, I mean, they, again, you know, they used to be even cheaper. But like you said, you know, you have to decide whether you want them or not, and then decide what your budget is, and then be ready to snipe when the right deal comes along, you know? So that seems, you know, a reasonable way to look at it. You know, obviously, there's there's a certain market value, which is open to manipulation, of course, um, especially on the internet, especially with um, some of these dealers that have a you know huge social media presence. But you know, there's also the value that can differ from the market value that the watch has for you. You know that can be horological, that can be sentimental, that can be any manner of things. And uh, that value can be slightly higher even than the market value. It can be significantly lower. So you just have to stand your ground and, and wait for the right moment. All right, guys, this is really the last minute. Uh, so maybe our only participant for today is Basil's Bezels. Um, if there's no second super chat before the next two, three minutes, uh, I'm going to close. We're going to pick up the thread of uh, this auction preview tomorrow. I looked through uh, you know, a few dozens of lots from the 
Sotheby's New York auction that's upcoming on March 7. And before that, we talked a little bit about new releases by Seiko uh, and Norcane, as well as uh, Louis Vuitton. So you can always roll back the tape to, to talk about that. Of course, we, well, I mean, I have uh, started with uh, looking at those two Cartier watches that um, belong to Michael Imperioli as Chris Montesanti. Bruce G., thank you. I mean the Tank Francis and, and uh, Pasha. I'm going to end the... Um, Bruce is laughing, the super sticker for 99. Well, you waited, you waited until the last moment to snipe. That's what a G. Smart. What a G. Smart. That's smart. Um, yeah, I was saying that um, I'm going to end the poll now. Uh, people have said, should I? Get a Cartier Pasha, 42% said yes, 27 said no, 31 said get something else. And not many people specified something else, but I guess Bruce G meant that he likes other stuff by pa uh, Cartier, for example, Santos or perhaps the tank. Um, Cartier is a girl's watch. You don't want that, Lord. Come on now. What? Which the one? Cartier is a girl's watch. I said, you don't want that garbage. No, I you know I was showing you that that particular presentation of the Santos. It's um, you know it's a lover's watch, and love <laughs> as you know love is love as you know. So <laughs> I just uh, you know what uh, for reference, Lord, you can you can look back on my Instagram photo that I sent you uh, earlier today. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fair. That's absolutely fair. Well, Meech, thank you for jumping on uh, towards the end. It was, as always, lovely to talk to you and nice to catch up with you. Uh, I'll be here tomorrow as well. Uh, Bruce G, by the way, before I log in, I will let me give you your number. Uh, you are number 37, and you can go to... Um, you already had also number 24 too. So I've increased your chances. And you can always go to the community page to check out the latest situation as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to see you right around the same time tomorrow. Hopefully, at uh, we'll start at, at 8 p.m. and go until midnight and maybe a little longer. Today, we started a little late, but... I made up for it. We still pulled in the four-hour shift. Thank you, Bruce G. And thank you, Bezos Bezos, for your super chats. Thank you, everyone, for your presence and support. Please hit the like button on your way out. And, uh, hey, I'm grateful to have you in the audience. What do you say, Meech? Um, gentlemen, it is Valentine's Day, so therefore... Uh, it's a public announcement here. Gentlemen, don't be silly. Wrap your willy unless you want thousands of dollars in child support. All right? Uh, so play it safe, gentlemen. Play it safe. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice month. Huh? It's, th this is the month that makes people like us, as you know, roughly speaking. I suppose when you look at it that way, but you know, nobody needs the extra tax dollars nowadays, if you know what I mean. Yeah, but I mean, you know, we we would love to have uh, have another Scorpio in the in the house as <laughs> always. But I mean, wise words as always from from Big Papa Meech. Thank you, everyone. We're logging off for today. We'll be here with you tomorrow. Until then, I bid you adieu. Take care. <laughs>